Good, e good afternoon. I'm calling our Board of Education meeting to order at 4 p.m. Welcome uh, to our meeting for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School, and it is open to the public. Uh, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, do we have a quorum? Yes, Mr. President, we do. Do we have any uh, items submitted for closed session items, public None input? at this time. All right, then I adjourn the meeting at 4 p.m. and we will return at 5.30 p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm reconvening our open session at 5.30 p.m. for our uh, RUSD Board of Education meeting for Thursday, October 5th, 2023. This meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD YouTube channel. And if you would like to view the meeting on our Spanish live stream, please follow the link provided on the agenda, which can be found on our website, riversideunified.org. Our meeting today will be held in the boardroom at the Riverside Adult School and is open to the public. A limited overflow meeting room with the television monitor will be available if the main boardroom meets capacity. And as always, the meeting will be live streamed on the RUSD board meeting YouTube channel. For members of the public who would like to address the board, please see a staff member at the entrance and they'll be happy to assist you. And at this time, I'll, I'm reporting that the board took no action uh, during closed session. Our Pledge of Allegiance today will be provided by video and will feature Andre Rocha, who is a sixth grade student from Mountain View Elementary School. Andre enjoys school because people are nice and respectful, and he likes being in the DLI program and learning two languages. His favorite subject is history, and he hopes to be a professional soccer player. <laughs> My name is Andre Rocha, and I am a sixth grade student at Mountain View Elementary School in the DLI program in Mrs. Shanahan and Mrs. Karasik in sixth grade classes. I would like to thank my mom and dad for supporting me and always helping me to do my best at school. I will recite the pledge in English and Spanish. Please remain standing for both. Please stand, put your right hand over your heart, Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Turn to the Spanish word. Yo prometo de hablar a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y a la República que le representa una nación Bajo Dios, invisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Great job by Andre, and it's always great to see our DLA, DLI program in action. We have a student performance today also, which is also provided by video, and it features students from the Ramona High School Madrigals. Thank you. Good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and other members of the board. My name is Ella McConnell, and I am a senior at Ramona High School. Buenas noches al Presidente Farouk, Superintendente Hill, y otros miembros del Consejo. Me llamo Ella McConnell, y soy en el grado 12 en la Escuela Ramona. In honor of our district's motto, The Time Is Now, Ramona Madrigals will be singing Time by Jennifer Lucy Cook under the direction of Ms. Jennifer Phillips. Con la lema del distrito, ahora es el tiempo, los madrigales de Ramona van a estar cantando Tiempo por Jennifer Lucy Cook en la dirección de Jennifer Phillips. The arts have helped me gain confidence and open my eyes to my passion of music. I plan to continue my education in music because of Ramona Choirs. Los artes me ayudó con, con mi confianza y voy a continuar mi educación en la música porque de los coros de Ramona. Please enjoy time. Por favor, disfrútate con tiempo. Time, you can spend it when you spend it, then you're running out of time. You can save it, but to save it is to take a little time. In a minute, when you're in it, can you feel the passing time? It's an illusion, there's confusion when they tell you now it's time. To be an older, time to work and time to waste, and there's no time. Not to hold it, time to tell them how you feel. All this little time, 3 to 1, 11, 32 a.m. and dinner time. Not to kill, I said I will, it's still a fizzle, fizzle time. <laughs> Time to get older, to work, time to waste, there's no time. 
Thank you to Ramona High School for providing that great performance. Uh, we'll now have our high school student uh, representatives uh, provide reports from their school sites uh, for their first reports of the year. And so we're welcoming Arlington, King, Lincoln, RVS, and EOC uh, this evening, starting with Samantha Nava from Arlington High School. Welcome, Samantha. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, good evening, President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. My name is Samantha Nava. I am a senior, and I'm involved in Arlington's Associated Student Body. This year, I serve as the ASB president, and I am pleased to be here representing Arlington High School to share some of the exciting events we have experienced so far. We hosted Aspire Week, our We Are Arlington Week, and Club Rush. The implementation of the AHS PBS plan was introduced school-wide through Aspire Week, the first week returning to school. Aspire Week taught the expected positive behaviors through crafted lessons, student-crafted videos, rallies with a focus on school culture, and an instructional focus on developing classroom culture. Aspire Week consisted of an adjusted bell schedule for each day during the student's first week back to school. Every day after fourth period, all students would engage in one of the following each day of the week a live Google Meet for AHS 101, a cultural building session filled with low-risk icebreaker activities, and three PBS lessons that allowed students to consider and discuss what it means to take care of ourselves, each other, and the community while in the classroom, on campus, and in the community. Students received their school planners during one of these lessons and learned that organizing ourselves throughout the year is a great way to take care of ourselves while in the classroom. To further implement our PBS program, our ASB also hosted a We Are Arlington Week. This consisted of a Spirit Week rally and football game. Our Spirit Week was based on dress up days that's purpose was to represent who you are and who you aspire to be. We got lots of participation and couldn't be happier. During this week, we handed out maroon shirts that said, We Are Arlington. And the purpose of this shirt was to create a strong community and campus pride. We provided a t-shirt for every single Arlington student to symbolize we are a community and to provide a sense of belonging here at Arlington. For our rally, we recognized all of our students who passed AP exams, heard from various club representatives, and had performances from AHS dance, cheer, Golden Pride band, and ballet folklorico groups to perform and showcase all the talent here on our campus. ASB hosted a lunchtime rally to help teach chants and advertise the home football game. Students who wore their We Are Arlington shirt were invited to join us at our first home football game. Their turnout was a huge success and our entire student section was wearing their We Are Arlington shirt. Lastly, I would like to share that we offered a club rush during lunch to share with all of our students the numerous opportunities they have to get involved at Arlington. And I would like to mention that we also offered our annual parent-teacher conferences as a way to strengthen our communication between our teachers and families here at Arlington High School. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to share about our amazing campus, and I look forward to bringing more information to you throughout the year. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Our next student report will be from Nicole Figueroa from Martin Luther King High School. Welcome, Nicole. Good evening, Dr. Fruk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. It is truly an honor to be here. Once again, I'm Nicole Figueroa, and I proudly represent Martin Luther King High School as your student board representative. With a fresh new year, King was able to have a fresh new beginning as we welcomed back 2,920 new students and staff members, including our new and amazing principal, Dr. Iconi. Although King ended off on a bit of a rocky note last year, we have quickly bounced back and embraced the packed values of purpose, ambition, character, and knowledge. I had the chance to speak with students and staff of all different backgrounds in campus, such as athletes, scholars, teachers, and my peers in general, all of which agreed on one common thing. 
they feel more welcomed and more confident on campus. This is through various new factors, such as the murals of Dr. King and Home of the Wolves outside of the school, and even my new things, such as teachers greeting them at the door, which helps foster the, the student-teacher relationship. King has also introduced a new platform of support for students, a wellness center that allows students to access to various outlets of mental health support, ranging from support counselors to a calming area for students to relax in. As mentioned, students feel more confident on campus, which is noticeably carried on to their extracurricular, extracurricular interest and involvement. King kicked off Club Rush the week of September 11th with 72 new clubs ranging from pickleball, cultural heritage, academic, and general interests. I believe this directly connects to the improvement of our school climate and the fact that students have gained more confidence in themselves and more confidence in the fact that they can become a leader for something they're passionate about without the fear of judgment. More clubs are not only the new addition to King. This year was our first year of having a girls football flag football team and they have been doing exceptionally well in bringing proud victories back home to King. Circling back to the positive climate, there has been one group that has shined the most when it comes to tackling and addressing important humanitarian and cultural topics around our school, our Multicultural Council, or MCC. MCC kicked off Suicide Prevention Awareness Week on September 25th to, 20, to the 29th. Students were able to participate in educational and positive activities like free art therapy and sending self-love affirmation notes to their peers. We also had a guest speaker come to MCC's classroom and speak about suicide awareness about, with an emphasis on reaching out to our peers when they need it and spreading a culture of love and support. It is truly the, the passion and desire to leave a legacy that drives King High School to greatness, and students have shown they are more than capable of setting King up for great, for great success, not only for themselves, but also for future generations. Thank you so much for allowing me to give this report. Thank you so much, Nicole. Great report. Our next student report is Miguel Uribe from Abraham Lincoln High School. Hello, hello. Okay. Welcome, Miguel. Yeah, thank you. Hello and good evening, uh, Board President uh, Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Miguel Uribe, and I'm on here. I'm here behalf. I'm here on behalf of Abraham Lincoln High School to bring you some updates on what is happening to our school. First, I want to thank all of the teachers and Lincoln staff for their hard work in preparing for this school year. We had our only we had our girls and boys volleyball season start up in August and had opportunities to play 10 regular season games against other continuation schools from all across the Inland Empire and are currently getting ready for the playoffs to start. Our sports program gives us the opportunity to engage in school and make life lifelong connections with our peers. In our auto CTE pathway, students completed their safety training and are currently working in our in our amazing auto shop. We are learning all we are learning about identifying the different tools that are available to us and when and how to use them. This knowledge will be used to earn uh, certifications we can use to get a job in the automotive industry. In our health CTE pathway, students are completing hands-on activities related to identifying blood type and checking for glucose levels, which are skills they will which are skills they will need in preparation for a medical back office position. We had our back to school night where parents had the opportunity to come into the school and meet with our teachers and staff and staff members. They receive information about all the events and resources that are available to them. This event provided us the opportunity to increase parent involvement. We want to take the time to recognize the 10 graduates that we will have at the end of the first quarter, which is next week. Currently, our early impact child care program is full of children ranging from six weeks to three years old. This is a great resource for our community and provides child, uh, child care for any of our teen parents. We are planning our college kickoff where students will get information about the requirements for college, fi financial aid, and the registration process. This is one of the many events that focus on getting us closer to our goal of attending college. Lastly, we celebrate the kickoff of Hispanic Heritage Month by having some, time, some lunchtime activities for the students to participate in. Thank you for the opportunity to share, share a few highlights from our school. This concludes my report. Thank you, Miguel. Great report. Our next student report is from Isabella Mendez from the Riverside Virtual School. Welcome, Isabella. Good evening, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Isabella Mendez. I am a senior at RVS, where I hold the positions of Senior Class Vice President and Ethnic Studies Representative. These roles have empowered me to develop my leadership skills and to work collaboratively with my fellow members of my school. I am excited to be here, and I am ready to report on my school. This year's academic theme is LEAD, meaning our trailblazers are learners, they are engaged, they are accountable, but most importantly, they are determined. Our goal is to provide opportunities to support student growth in these areas and recognize when students are demonstrating lead values. 
we plan to celebrate our students in our video announcements, the RVS daily download. The, to begin the school year, we held back to school night on August 16th, the third day of school. We offered an in-person opportunity for students, families, and staff members to have dinner, connect, and begin building relationships so we can work as a unified team to support student learning, engagement, and well-being this year. We hosted back to school night at ELC, and we are so grateful for the partnership this school year. We invited EOC to take part in our annual senior sign-on event to celebrate the start of senior year and provide resources to ensure seniors are on track and prepared for graduation. Two students at RVS said, senior sign-on was such a wonderful event. I was able to meet many of my friends and classmates and I got a lot of information about graduation and my pathway to college. Another said, it was so refreshing to have a support system that will help me get prepared for college. September 21st, we held our Heritage and Legacy Family Night. Mr. Sorensen grilled dinner. We had representatives from the Family Resources Center and our Heritage and Legacy advisors and counselors provided support for Google Classroom and ARIES. We also offered a series of academic field trips this September. Starting, we had our trip to the Civil Rights Institute where we had, where students learned about redlining and social injustices against our African American community in Riverside. The following week, we attended the Harada Lecture where we were given the opportunity to learn about Japanese Americans and land-owning immigration laws here in Riverside and California. After the lecture, students were given the opportunity to socialize with the lawyers and Riverside officials. Many students, including me, were offered internships with law firms, invitations to volunteer events, and we were able to speak to Ms. Harada, who I later invited to come speak at RVS. That same week, Abbott invited our trailblazers to UCLA for a college fair. The students were given an opportunity to watch a college football game. Although we are a virtual school, we pride ourselves on all the in-person activities and opportunities we are able to offer to our students to enhance their virtual learning experiences. Thank you so much for having the time to take me here. And I cannot wait to share more about RVS in our future meetings. Thank you, Isabella. Great report. <laughs> our final report is from Eden Phillips from the Educational Options Center. Welcome, Eden. Hello and good evening, Board President Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of the board. My name is Eden Phillips, and I'm here on behalf of ESC to bring you some updates of what's been happening at our school. ESC teachers and staff have worked hard to create an inviting learning environment for our students. Students are welcomed by staff as they arrive on campus, while teachers warmly greet each student as they enter each classroom. Our CTE Health Pathway class is in full swing, giving our Ring Cross and Summit View access to learning skills that they can use to earn industry certifications. It will allow them to get a medical job, a job in the medical industry in the future. In our AVID class at ESC, students are learning valuable skills, such as organizational binders, planning, et cetera, that they can use in their post-secondary plans. On September 16th, students attended a college and career fair at UCLA and were able to stay and watch the UCLA versus North Carolina Central football game. In our first senior sign-up day at ESC, which is like the comprehensive school's version of a senior sunrise day, where ESC and RVS joined forces in this student event to provide students with FAFSA support, counselor chats, cabin gown orders, as well as raffles and games. It was a great opportunity to engage in school activities and get motivated for graduation. ESC participates in the Alternative Education Sports League, where, the, ah, where we compete against the surrounding Alt-Ed schools. We are currently playing volleyball where students get to have fun while exercising. Our students get to work hard as a team in their effort to win. Sports also provides us the opportunity to make connections with our peers and keep us engaged in school. We also had back to school night where students got the opportunity to take their parents around to each of the classes and show them everything that they have been learning and introduce them to all their teachers. This event provides us the opportunity to increase parental involvement. We had a group of ELC students attend the UCAN HBCU recruitment fair at Martin Luther King High School. Students got to meet with admissions officials, recruiters, and recruiters representing hundreds of majors and professional degrees. Ring Cross submitted their model continuation application. This program recognizes and honors outstanding continuation high schools for the comprehensive programs. Lastly, we have been taking part in attendance contests to improve daily attendance by helping motivate students to come to school every day. There's a traveling trophy for classes with the best attendance, as well as students receiving positive messages through the school's auto dialer system. Students with great attendance can also earn points towards prizes and raffles to other rewarding events. Thank you for this opportunity. This concludes my report. Thank you, Eden, for that great report. 
I want to thank all of you for, for your reports. Uh, this is a public meeting, so you're always welcome to stay, but uh, feel free to leave if, if you prefer as well. So thank you so much again for your great reports. Uh, so we'll now turn to district group reports. Our first group report is provided by the California School Employees Association. Their president, Ms. Anai Chang, is unavailable, so we're going to turn it over to first vice president, Mr. Mike Green. Welcome, Mr. Green. Thank you. It's good to see you guys. Good evening, Superintendent Renee Hill, President and Angelo Farouk, distinguished board members, and everyone here tonight. First, our executive board has undergone some changes. I am the newly seated first vice president of CSEA Chapter 506. I previously served Chapter 506 as second vice president and ran a successful site rep program. I have volunteered countless hours in the chief teller position. I coordinate with the treasurer and oversee the online voting for the entire 1,700 plus member chapter. Next, the secretary was replaced by Anthony Sines. Anthony was a past communications officer for the chapter and also a past negotiator for the CFCA team. I, along with the e-board, would like to thank them for their dedication and appreciate that they chose to step up and volunteer to help the chapter run successfully. Second, Riverside, Chapter 506 was highlighted in the CFCA's Focus Magazine, which covers all the chapters throughout California. Our Focus Magazine highlights many different events and activities th throughout the 700 plus chapters. This particular issue highlighted the ACE activities or appreciation of classified employees and highlighted how together the chapter and district work to select from paraeducators, campus supervisors, aquatics, carpentry, irrigation workers, translators, health assistants, media assistants, kitchen operators, nutrition specialists, registrars, custodians, assessment technicians, and accounting assist assistants to be shadowed by school board members, cabinet exec executives, chief of staff, director of classified personnel, and superintendent Renee Hill. All in all, it was a successful event with the administrators working side by side with us, which was humbling and uplifting and has brought the morale up in our chapter. In addition, this year we will begin to live stream chapter meetings to all active members of chapter 506. Lastly, we are soliciting the voices of our membership as they advocate to clarify language in our contract and negotiate equitable benefits, salary, better working conditions, including workload, dignity at work, and morale. In particular, our instructional aid ones who help out in the classrooms and do not have the time to prep but enter at a moment when the lessons are already in progress. The current team cleaning program metrics are not meant for schools but for high-rise buildings. The program metrics do not meet the cleanliness levels for the needs of a district this large. Our elementary library media assistants advocating for more work days to accommodate the needs of their site. Thank you for your time, and this concludes my report for CSEA Chapter 506. Thank you, Mr. Green. Please give our regards to everyone at CSEA. Thank you. Our, our next report is uh, delivered by Ms. Laura Bowling, president of the Riverside City Teachers Association. And uh, welcome, Ms. Bowling. Good evening, Board President Farouk, Sir Superintendent Hill, and school board members. Good to see you all this evening. I'm excited to announce that RCTA will be sponsoring over 25 educators over the next several months at various CTA and other educational conferences throughout Southern California. This weekend, over 10 special education educators will be attending the CTA Special Education Conference in Orange County. Towards the end of the month, our USD educators will be attending the LGBTQ plus CTA Issues Conference. We had several teachers attending the PBIS Leadership Conference in Chicago. Our CTA is committed to providing PD to our members that will benefit them in the classroom that will ultimately be a win for our students. Our CTA continues to advocate for our special education educators. They are at the, they are at the forefront of our concerns continuing into the year. We pro progress with work groups for our psycholo psychologist educators. We meet in conjunction with our USD on a monthly basis to work toward providing equity with caseload and assignment considerations, just to name a few things.
We will begin, the, we will begin this Monday meeting with SPED educators to provide the district and the bargaining team with the most crucial concerns that they face providing the best possible service to their students. In the middle of the month, RCTA will be hosting the high school student advisors that have unique concerns about providing services across their very large high school at caseloads. Lastly, it's good to see that, that at elementary, there has been a decline in combination classes across the district. 18 combo classes is still too many. Ask those 18 elementary teachers. There has to be some thought on how we address the concerns at a DLI school that has to have a combo classes in the new non-DLI class, classes. We must be able to be able to provide equity for all students. Please be mindful that we are we go into the next several weeks as teachers prepare for progress reports, report cards, parent teacher conferences, and many other things on their plate. That we all show grace and empathy for our educators, classified staff, and administrators. The profession is not for the weak. Thank you for your time and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Bolin. Great report and please give our best to your colleagues. I'll now pass it over to Superintendent Hill to provide her report. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Since the last board meeting, I've had the privilege to visit Sunshine, Victoria Elementary, Gage, and RVS High Schools. We're working diligently to align learning tasks with the very rigorous state standards. I have seen improved levels of questioning that are going beyond who, what, where, and when questions. And I have seen students working independently more often where the tasks are robust and meaningful. We're making strides in the right direction and we will remain focused on the goals of improved student learning and on well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. At this time, members of the public may provide comments on any items of business to be transacted or discussed by the board that are not already listed on this evening's agenda. The board is limited to responses that they may wish to offer on topics that have not been agendized, yet are permitted to ask clarifying questions as to a presenter's public comments. Also, there were no public comments submitted for this meeting via the electronic communication submission form uh, for people wanting to provide input remotely. Uh, trustee, uh, our board clerk, Trustee Hunt, has provided these comment cards. And so we'll uh, begin with uh, Lisa, do you, Reuter? Reuter, followed by Randall De Reuter, followed by Curtis Kiesler. Point of order, if I may. Um, I just want to remind the chair and as well as the participants, while sometimes emotions understandably are, are uh, strong, that the Brown Act, which governs all public meetings in California right. and means in public as this one is, uh, forbids that an employee's name, not us, but an employee's name would be used in presentation and disgruntlement. So if we may. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Lisa, please pr proceed. Um, okay, my heart's beating. Um, I'm not used to going up here, but um, I watched a, a video with, it was um, 2022 of May, where the board decided they were gonna have a new dress code and you were saying that, you know, a picture says a thousand words and that you wanted a um, example for the parents and all the nitty gritty. And I was so grateful for you. And Dal was saying, I um, can't remember because it was a long thing, so I don't have to look. But you were saying, um, I'm going to have to have what body maturity is going to be and how we're going to actively enforce that. And you were saying it would be wisdom and everybody's agreeing with you. And at the end, you took a vote only because Dr. Angelo said it was not materially changed. It was going an administrative. It was an administrative process. But Mr. Um, Dr. Mr. Marshall says it's done and we can't undo this. But the the three one. What is it? The code. The dress code is. Um, what is that one? It says that we are allowed to um, change it and renew it annually. Um, what's this one? Five one three two and that it can't be a distraction. President of Health and Safety has to be appropriate. But the new dress code and the nitty gritty, she, um, she said that there, ha there was, it used to say no midriff or bathing tops, no sexually suggestive or obscene clothing, no low cut or revealing tops, no halter tops, no tube tops, 
no undergarments. And then when she came in 2023, um, it said that bra straps and straps on undergarments can show, visible waistlines can show, no swimwear or similar design worn as outerwear, which makes no sense because um, the pants are spanks they're wearing and um, your underwear showing. So I drew my own picture, you know, because Dr. Marshall said you can't have an example for the parents. We're not allowed to be board members. Students are, you know, board members and no administrators can be board members or, you know, and I just want to say that I did some research on my own and Modesto, California said they took a vote and I think her name was Cindy Marks and she said that there was 83% um, of the parents strongly disagreed and 83% of the uh, staff and 81% of the parents strongly disagrees on this and the students were divided so that's more than the majority so I don't see how we got a vote and it was done during Zoom she said Mrs. Uh, Dr. Hernandez she said the kids were there the three board members one of them said it was during it was actually COVID November 2021 when it started um, and she said that it was virtual communica communication and she couldn't talk to anybody. The girl said she wished she could have. But anyways, here's one. Okay, th thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This concludes the, your three minutes. The, you, you'll have to share that information uh, via email or come back at another time. Our staff can follow up with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Randall Duyeter, followed by Curtis Kiesling, followed by Sheena Baldwin. Welcome, Randall. You have three minutes. Good evening. I'm a father of five girls, five girls, seven boys. I have eight of my children who went through, graduated through this district. I have um, two that are presently going through. One's in kindergarten. I'm going to be here a while. Okay. The dress code that we have is immoral. There's not one person in here that has a bare midriff, shoulders hanging out, you can see their elastic on their underwear. We're all adults here, right? We're all dressed because we want to be dignified and we want to show everybody that we, we at the same time look at you and we want to be respected and we dress respectfully. But we do not do that for our children. Our children, we are allowed to sit there and have them scantily clad. Are we raising the next Hooter girls? Are we raising the next strippers? No, we're not. We're trying to raise our children to be dignified, to have dignified jobs, to even have your jobs maybe someday. But if we don't show them dignity, how are they going to learn dignity? How are they going to learn how to dress for a, a job interview, dress for a wedding, dress to meet somebody for the first time? The school rules are basically we can wear elastic, we can, we can show our guys are allowed to sag their pants, which is a jail thing. Why are we trying to raise thugs? We don't want to raise thugs. We want to raise children. Children are our most precious, right? When you go to court, I was just in, uh, as a juror, there's a dress code. The reason there's a dress code is because they don't want anybody else to be distracted because you might be judging somebody on a life or death situation. So if you're distracted about it, somebody might have their life ended or incarcerated forever. No, school is about reading, writing, and arithmetic. Fashion shows and those things can be done elsewhere. I, I'm a taxpayer. You guys are elected. All I ask is you guys look at what we're saying and have our children be dignified the whole time. I, it seems to me that we can do better. You know, uh, we, we do have to answer to, the, to God. And I believe that if we don't sit there and have some dignity, we don't bring it in now, uh, that answer is going to be really rough on us. And so I'm saying, let's go revisit the dress code. Let's look things over and let's have our children look dignified. We don't want our children to look like this. And this is okay through school or because they have long legs, they can show their butt cheeks. That's not right. That's not okay, anywhere. Thank you. That, that concludes your thank remarks. Our staff will follow up. Our next speakers are Curtis Kiesling, followed by Felicia Garner, followed by Sheena Baldwin. 
Welcome, Curtis. You have three minutes. Good evening, uh, Superintendent Hill, Board President Farouk, and uh, board members. <clears throat> First, uh, let me thank the board and all those involved in the Measure O improvements that are taking place at University Heights Middle School. As each phase is completed, the campus looks better and is more functional, and we thank you for that. However, all of these improvements have done little to help uh, the staff and students feel safer on the campus. I understand new and improved cameras are being installed sometime in November, and that's nice, but does not address the issue of students and staff feeling unsafe on campus. How do the cameras help the student who was assaulted by five other students feel safe when two or three of those students are allowed to return to our campus? Whose rights are more important? The victim of the five-on-one assault who has to go to school with the students who assaulted him or the rights of the perpetrators? In the most recent act of violence, a University Heights student struck a staff member three times and was allowed to return to our campus. What do you say to a student who is chronically absent because they are afraid of the perpetrator who struck the SAF member? This student, who is also a victim, has been constantly bullied by the perpetrator in middle school and elementary school to the point that they don't feel safe at school and does not want to be there. Again, whose rights and safety are we protecting? Whose education is more important? Let me be perfectly clear. I believe that the staff at University Heights Middle School feels that our site administrators, campus supervisors, counselors, are, are doing and have done all they can to make University Heights a safe place. The problems are way, are, excuse me, the problems are in many ways beyond their ability to fix. As I close, I wanna thank Mr. Tom Walker for coming to our campus to hear our concerns the university staff shared many ideas and suggestions of programs and policies that could be put in place to address the violence on our campuses. Mr. Walker indicated that he would share the information with the cabinet and we expect to hear from him in the coming months. I look forward to learning about the programs and policy changes that will be implemented. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Curtis. Our next speakers are Felicia Garner, followed by Sheena Baldwin, followed by Brown P. Welcome, Felicia. You have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Felicia Garner, and I am a teacher at University Heights Middle School. I have worked for the district in different capacities for over 20 years, and I am a North High School graduate. Additionally, all four of my children have attended RUSD schools. I want to begin by stating that I teach at my dream school. Our students are special and our staff extraordinary. The first time I stepped onto UNI's campus, I knew this school was different, and I knew that I wanted to be part of that difference. I believe in this school so much that my own daughter is a current seventh grader at UNI. Unfortunately, there have been a number of events in recent years that demonstrate a trend of increasing violence within both our school and our district. These acts include fights where multiple students attack a single victim, bomb threats made on social media, 911 calls about an active shooter on campus, and assaults against staff members. In these situations, the district has shown a lack of safety measures for students and staff. As a school employee, staff members are first responders, but our current district protocols and resources are lacking. Furthermore, the lack of real significant consequences to the small number of students who are committing these acts set a precedent that engaging in these types of behaviors are acceptable. After these students return to school with minor consequences for reprehensible behaviors, other students are empowered to threaten violence or assault others, knowing that the consequences are insignificant. We call upon the board to recognize the growing issue of violence within our school communities. We also ask that the board make a pledge to truly put safety first, both for our students and our staff. Ways that you as our elected school board can support us are, pledge to put a full-time SRO on every school campus. This will be a visual representation to our students that safety is a priority and threats or acts of violence are not tolerated within our schools. Implement a universal progressive discipline policy where students who are repeat offenders for the same act understand that their actions will not be tolerated in any school within our district. Institute a program similar to DDP, where students who engage in violent acts or make threats of violence are able to learn ways to cope with feelings and emotions, learn to control anger, and learn life skills to help them be successful students and adults. The lack of action against violence threats 
not with leadership within our school, but with district leadership. It is time the parents and the public understand where this lack of action is coming from. It is our duty as educators and your responsibility as members of the board to not sit back and allow violence to continue on our campuses, but to provide the education and resources that our student population needs to prevent violence such as those that have occurred on UNI's campus. As a staff member of RUSD, I'm requesting you do all in your power to make sure that our school sites have the authority to effectively combat this growing threat to safety. I do not wish to be afraid. Threats and acts of violence must be dealt with in a manner that maintains the safety of our entire school community. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. Our next speakers are Sheena Baldwin, followed by Brown P, followed by Sandy R. Welcome, Sheena. Um, welcome. Three or, thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I'm Sheena Baldwin from University Heights Middle School. Um, I'm a seventh grade teacher, but first and foremost, I am a parent. And that is, through, that is the lens through which I think and I speak. As I sat in the union meeting yesterday, and as I watched events unfold in the last three years, I asked myself, do the parents really understand what is happening? Are the parents aware of how we are dealing with violence in our school? In the meeting, it was explained to us that the actions that help keep our school safe were all in the parent handbook. But do the parents really understand? Because we first meet with our, back, with, our, with our parents at back to school night, we see that they are afraid. They are worried about leaving their children, their babies, in our care. And I know this because I have been in their very same position. But as a teacher, I know it is our job to alleviate those fears, to tell them we have bullying interventions in place, we know our lockdown procedures, I know to say that we will do everything in our power to keep their child safe from harm and to teach them. But as events have unfolded over the last three or four years, I question what they really know. Do the parents know that if situations escalate into violence, then teachers' hands are tied? We can no longer act to protect their child if in a fight one-on-one, -on -one, three on one, five on one. I cannot step in. I cannot pull the aggressor off the child unless I take a voluntary course so that I can do so without harming the aggressor. Do they know this? That as their child gets beaten by five other kids that I cannot step in. Do they know this? That as an aggressor, threatens another child with immediate violence, I cannot step between them to prevent the blows that will prevail. Because if I do, I will take the beating without any real consequence to the aggressor. That if I push back, I put myself at risk of a lawsuit or losing my job. Do they know this? Do they know that, I ch that a child can have a weapon deemed illegal in California in their backpack and as long as it's not brandished, they will receive a slap on the hand and then be placed back into the very same class that is with their kids. Do they know this? Do they know that a student can threaten a teacher online, threaten to put a stool through her face, ask others to kill her if he doesn't do it first, that a child can come back after five days of that Thank you. Thank you, Sheena, for your report. Our last three speakers are Brown Peace, followed by Sandy R, followed by Lance Kinnex. Is Brown P here? She's not. Okay. Uh, so welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. You're wrong, Mr. Hunt. I can name names if I wish. Um, I filed a complaint about a coach making vulgar, degrading, and racist comments to my son, and your response to me was, it's beyond the six-month window. The only reason I had to document it again is because your principal, Mr. Ibarra, and the athletic director failed to document it, and then claimed that I never complained. I provided Mr. Walker with the recording to prove that those claims were false. Superintendent Hill is well aware, and if she won't hold her staff accountable, maybe it's time for you to hold her accountable. So let's talk about football boosters. I'm going to quote from your booster manual, and then I'm gonna circle back on why these are issues. As entities separate from the district, the booster club should 
Also be recognized that the school or district personnel may not manage or direct the booster club operations. Neither the school or the district may lead others to believe it is in charge or has any responsibility or authority over a booster or a parent organization. What not to do for a booster? Do not conduct fundraising activities requiring students to participate. Do not commingle booster or parent organization funds with ASB funds. Do not represent booster or parent organization activities as those of the district or one of its schools. Do not charge parents or students or imply that payments are required to participate. And um, Anything by booster club should be primarily conducted by adult volunteers. The school's ASB is the primary fundraising mechanism of students. Students can participate in a booster club fundraiser as long as the participation is clearly voluntary and the student clearly identifies that they are raising funds for the booster club. Fundraisers cannot be held during the school day. The school day is considered to be one hour before the start of school and one hour after the end of the school day. Now I'm going to share my experiences with Arlington High School's Booster Club. Late April of 2023, my son, and this is within the six month window, the rest of the football team, the entire football team was instructed by coach to have a seat, take out their phones, download the app called Money Dolly on their phones. They were then told they had to set up an account and send the link to 25 people before they could practice. I found out about the fundraiser when I received the link from my son. I didn't know we would be starting a fundraiser since I hadn't heard anything about this from the booster board. I reached out to the board and they were as surprised as I was that a fundraiser had been started and they said they would look into it and get back to me. Apparently this fundraiser was started by the coach and not the booster board, but it was done through the football booster charity. The coach set of gold of $300 for spirit packs for the boys athletic wares and 600 total to be raised in order to not have a charge. When we left Arlington, we requested a refund of our donation since we would not be getting a spirit pack and would, not be, would need to buy a new spirit pack. The request was made to the board and Dr. Duncan stated I would not be getting a refund. She had no authority to make that claim. She has no function. Did you spot all the violations or do I need to spell them out for you? In case Thank I need to spell part. them out, here's the complaint. Our last public comment uh, for this portion of the agenda is Lance Kennex. Mr. Kennex. Welcome, Mr. Kennex. You have three minutes. Good evening. Um, I've been very pleased with the, uh, with the staff and the principal at Bryant Elementary. Um, but I did have a concern relating to AR, the Accelerated, Accelerated Reader Program, which incentivizes uh, the pages or the books that children read. Um, they get points towards a goal, could be a class goal or an individual goal. Uh, well, my family purchased a, uh, a set of books uh, recognizing Hispanic Heritage Month, and we found out afterwards that uh, the AR program does not give credit for these books. And uh, just looking into it further, I understand that it's a private company, uh, but it seems unwise that the district would outsource the decisions on which books to incentivize to a private company, especially in these times where there are uh, commercial and political pressures to restrict which books children read. Um, I understand AR is a pretty good tool, but I think there should be a policy and a practice of supplementing the reward system so that children can receive incentives for books that fall outside of AR. Um, just for my children in particular, I have a fourth grader and a kindergartner, and my fourth grader reads above grade level, and it's been very difficult finding uh, books appropriate to his reading level that are nonfiction chapter books, especially about ethnic minorities. Uh, and so that's the reason why we have gone outside of the school library and purchased the books. But uh, he is incredibly disappointed that uh, he can't be incentivized in the same way uh, that other kids are. So maybe there could be a way of manually just adding points at the end of the trimester, at the end of the year, to make sure that kids who do this additional reading um, still get gold medals and classroom treats and all the other things uh, that the kids get. And I just brought copies of the book so you can see what I'm talking about. These are books uh, by authors who have other books 
uh, that receive the incentive through AR, and these are publishers who have other books receiving the incentives through AR. And of course, some of these are about uh, historical figures who have other biographies through AR, even if not at my children's reading level. So it seems like the publishers are reputable, the authors are reputable, the subject matter is important, um, and so we should receive some accommodation. Thank you. Thank you, and our staff will follow up on that. Our, this concludes our public input portion, and we'll now turn to board member comments, starting with our student board member, Odera Arin. Uh, hi. Um, my last report, I talked about a um, new program that we're implementing at King High School. Uh, we're one of the first uh, high schools to implement this program. It's called uh, Five Star. Uh, there have been other schools that have implemented this program, such as Great Oak. Um, and this program is essentially if you imagine a chart, and that chart you can, um, if you to, let's say you were go to, you're going to the bathroom, right? On that chart, chart you write your name, you uh, check in the sign in, and then you walk out. And so uh, we can look at the sign out chart and see that this person has signed out to go to the bathroom. And then when that person returns, they can check back in and then on the sheet. Now, imagine that uh, chart, that sheet, but digitally. That's what Five Star is about. And that sign-in check-in sheet isn't just for bathrooms, but it's also for um, if you're involved in clubs, if you're involved in sports, if you're involved in athletics. And so uh, in my previous report, I talked about how we're testing it. Uh, and now we've implemented it school-wide, so all students have access to the Five Star app. Their ID is in that app. Uh, they're able to check in, check out for bathrooms. They're able to get passes to go see their counselors, um, et cetera. And why we're implementing this program is to address the concerns about safety that we see in schools, right? Uh, some of these fights, they break out in uh, bathrooms. Uh, there's um, vaping issues in other bathrooms and such. And so, it's a little too early to say something about the results of Five Star yet. Um, it's gonna require the co cooperation of students in addition to teachers, but we're hoping that uh, the, imp the implementation of this app would be a step towards uh, better safety in schools and such. Um, in addition to my report, uh, I would like to talk about a uh, policy that Martin Luther King High School is implementing uh, to promote inclusivity uh, regarding our homecoming. Uh, typically in high school homecomings, you have your high school king and queen, um, princes and princesses and all that. Uh, but we changed it so that uh, it's not called royalty. So we've broken up um, the school into five categories, academics, extracurriculars, clubs, visual arts and performing arts and athletics. And for each category, there is a royalty of academics, royalty of uh, extracurriculars, et cetera. Uh, why we're implementing this policy is because traditionally, if you break it up between classes, right, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, there is no guarantee that it's gonna represent the whole school. You might just have all cheerleaders or all um, um, athletes for the men and the women. Uh, for both categories and then also how do you include um, students with uh, non-traditional gender identities with the prince and princess labels and so uh, with this change in categories we're seeing more participation in voting because uh, students vote for their homecoming nominees so in previous years we would be lucky to have 300 people vote uh, the first day that we opened up voting over a thousand people per, per, per category participated. So we're seeing higher participation. Uh, we're gonna see, uh, we're seeing better representation uh, with the nominees who were uh, selected to run for homecoming royalty and all that. We're seeing uh, diversity, not just in uh, race and gender, but also diversity in their skill sets, what they're involved in, like visual arts, athletics, extracurricular, extracurriculars, clubs, academics, et cetera. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you for your report and your valued input and leadership for the voice of our students. Thank you, Dara. Uh, I'll turn to our board clerk, Trustee Hunt. 
Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, first, I want to commend the University Heights Middle School teachers and staff for coming here tonight. Um, you know, time passed quite a while ago. Folks didn't dare uh, come here, and that's wrong because we do want your input, and you're the ones on campus, just like having a student board member that really lets us know what's happening. I, too, would look forward to uh, what the report is uh, about this incident and incidents, and I know Deputy Superintendent Walker is, is always uh, up front on it. I also know that Riverside Unified, though sometimes it's misunderstood, but that's okay. Riverside Unified has one of the highest expulsion rates of any district adjoining and really uh, above the state's average. So um, I want to keep that. Uh, I'm not throwing it back on Sacramento, but you have to excuse me. My oxygen's getting a little low. So, um, but Sacramento has introduced even more legislation. And uh, I know there was 13 bills passed that affect the uh, uh, public schools. We need to see what those are. But even more legislation that uh, confines the ability of campus personnel, teachers included, particularly teachers included in classroom discipline management. And it's very tough, uh, I realize, but we do have a lobbyist that we pay for. He's the best in California when it comes to education issues. He's head and shoulders. And I think it would be good to have that discussion with him, Dr. Farouk. Uh, on the comments made by the parent about spirit packs and fundraising, um, it's been a while since I was a member of a booster club, but I remember some of those rules, and we need to be sure they're being abided by superintendent. And uh, I would like care of clarification, because this goes back quite a ways. When I remember my girls were at Poly, and they were, you know, we were spending a few bucks on water polo, but I recall that it was like three thousand dollars or so to be a cheerleader with all things they have to buy. So, and I always, that makes me distressed because I don't want any child to not have the opportunity to be a full student, to have the full, particularly high school, experience. So what I'd like to, uh, I would ask for uh, Superintendent Hill, that we can have a clarification on what the student athlete, band members, et cetera, uh, are given that is provided by the district, and then what is incumbent upon the student athlete and their families to provide. I know I've said before up here that uh, track shoes run about a, with the spikes, you know, they run about $140. Well, that's quite a bit. You know, my old coach, Roger Folsom, when he passed, uh, his family set up a foundation that we hope to raise more money for. Here you are, USD, that would help out young people. But I want to know what that is. I'd also like to understand uh, exactly why. I know the young man, the parents' uh, student athlete, transferred to a different high school. And uh, so I'd like to understand her uh, allegations that she requested, seems to me, uh, you know, understandable requested a uh, refund of her spirit pack, um, which I think she mentioned was $600 because her child was gonna go to La Sierra High, different high, and obviously we have to come up with the same thing there. So unless things were purchased on a commitment, uh, I'd like to understand why the family can't be um, reimbursed for that cost. Uh, it's always been a soft spot for me to uh, understand that. While uh, convalescing in a hospital for 11 days, where, by the way, there's no cable, and I refuse to watch uh, Judge Judy again, <laughs> so uh, I found some time to do some reading. I've always been a news hound, and I'm impressed with the plethora of articles 
on education, whether it's international or to local, um, you know, this region at least. Uh, I just want to say a few things. I'm, I'm a big CTE advocate, career tech education. And um, Walmart just announced that they are going to be changing the job descriptions for the corporate level jobs that, you know, there'll still be many that require a college degree, but if an applicant can show that they have prior experience that would apply to those, um, to the qualifications for that job, uh, they're going to waive it. This is following a trend among American and global companies such as IBM, Accenture, and Google. It only, and my colleagues say, here goes Tom again with his drumbeat, but it only emphasizes, and I think after COVID we saw more of this and some changes, it only emphasizes that the more we can provide and fund CTE, the better we are. There's jobs, I know we have them, and I wanna say expanded cybersecurity. There's 500,000 jobs in America today that is looking for applicants for that. And we see the terrible things that are happening with cyber and what it can do. Uh, those are important, drones and um, hy hydroponics and others. Um, lastly, on a personal note, I wanna thank my colleagues and the cabinet for uh, when I returned from the hospital, uh, finding a very impressive and beautiful flower arrangement. It brightened my family's spirits and my own. If there's a benefit from being di diagnosed with cancer, for me, the last two months, it'll be two months Sunday, that it significantly advances for me determination to reprioritize things. For me, those include in order faith to walk closer to my creator, my family to cherish, and I just suggest some of these to you. God forbid you would be diagnosed, but to cherish and my family and defend the time with them, especially with my high school girlfriend, wife of 40 years, Jerry Pepio Hunt. My friends, I'm blessed, really, that I have friends that we moved to Riverside when I was eight that go back to grade school and many since then and several in this room and up at this dais. My business to look at what is possible and what's just a, you know, try, they always say it's, you can launch, launch a thousand ships, but it's the one that you bring into port that counts. And RUSD, true to my oath of office, focused on student achievement, uh, CTE, as I mentioned, and others, uh, DLI we're gonna talk about tonight, and I'm so proud of that program. Support for our employees, and whether that's compensation to be the strongest in this region so we attract and retain school safety, as Uni pointed out tonight, and very important, as the gentleman from our uh, CSEA pointed out, a sense of inclusion and input. And then lastly, uh, that to continue to develop greater communication and offerings for enhanced public input. I am more committed to all of those things than I ever was on August the 7th. Uh, finally and recently, just to give you some insight and that's all, um, at a recent family gathering, one of our great nieces, Vivian, I think she's nine now, uh, understands a diagnosis of cancer. And she asked my wife, Jerry, is Uncle Tom gonna die? Which is, and my very astute and loving wife, and this is now my bumper sticker, uh, responded, no honey, Uncle Tom isn't dying from cancer, he's learning to live with it. And uh, I think that is for any of us, learning to live with these divisive times in America. And uh, I, I would like to uh, ask uh, our staff to consider, uh, our superintendent, excuse me, to consider. I saw that a, a district up in Northern California has implemented a curriculum, I, it may be elective, I'm not sure, on con conflict resolution. And uh, 
that certainly, when you think about what the folks from uni had to say, that certainly would uh, enhance campus life if the kid took it seriously and go into our future adulthood. I thank you for your time and patience and yours, Dr. Furr. Thank you, Trustee Hunt, uh, for, for your thoughts, but know that um, our, we've been praying for you and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you for, for being here and for your dedication to, to, the, to the work that we do. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn to Dr. Hernandez-Alexander. I, I just want to start with saying thank you so much to uh, Trustee, my colleague, my friend, a brave man who um, always astonishes me how much he's really, truly thinking about students in the community and those things that are big and small, um, you're always looking out and I, just, I admire you for always being that type of board member that sees the high and sees the low um, perspectives from, um, from, you know, let's go talk to Sacramento about changing policies to let's go do something about reimbursing a check. I think that's, uh, that speaks volumes to the, the man that you are. So I, I thank you for that example. Um, I just wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, give a quick update. I got to visit uh, Victoria Elementary. It was actually the first school I've been able to visit this fall. Um, I was really impressed with uh, the uniqueness of that campus. There's this beautiful orchard of uh, apples and oranges uh, and, and trees in, in, in the campus that was wonderful. It was great to see a lot of our facilities um, uh, persons out there fixing things and painting and making uh, the campus beautiful. I was impressed to see uh, avid study strategies being implemented in the elementary school at the elementary level and that was um, really great to see. Um, and it, you know, it helps our students succeed in school and obviously prepares them for college. And I want to put a pin in that to say that um, it is because of the deep care of our teachers that our students are excelling, um, learning beyond their grade, learning um, so much so much about empathy and, and how to behave. And so I want to thank um, all of the teachers from uni that are here today. Uh, we, we are with you, we stand with you, we are working on making sure that you not just feel safe, but that you are safe. Um, that is not falling on deaf ears. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you show up every day for your students. And like one of the teachers um, that I presented today, you're living your dream job, you're living your calling, you're living your purpose, and you're doing it for that reason. And so we are here to support that in any way that we can. Um, when, there's two things I noticed when Ms. Jackson took me around the campus um, in Victoria. Uh, one of them is that I, I was impressed to see the investment in um, intervention specialists in the classrooms, I think, and I hope that's um, bringing some, some real, need assistant, real needed assistance to you teachers. Um, I also noticed that there was more men teaching in the elementary level, and I was really happy to see that. Much of the data that we're seeing over the last few years is that there is a lack of male educators. There is a lack of male students in colleges right now. And because of that, there is a, there is a void of, of male educators. And so it is something that we have on our radar and it's something that we need to uh, continue to address, create uh, uh, conditions for success for, so that men uh, want to get into the education field. Um, I always say, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And so if we want our boys to not just go to college or to pursue a career, um, but also to pursue education, it's good for them to see educators that look like them. Um, I, finally, I just want to say um, this is our last board meeting uh, during Latino History and Heritage Month. And so today I'm honoring the indigeneity of Latinos and our, our rootedness in this continent of America. Thank you to the parent that mentioned that um, he is having his students, his parent, his kids, I'm sorry, read um, about the many historic um, and many um, contributions of the Latino people in this country. Uh, this Monday, I was uh, honored to join the fellow RUSD parents for La Comunidad's first ever Hispanic heritage celebration. Mm -hmm. Fue una celebración de herencia hispana 
Uh, muy bonita. Uh, we enjoyed uh, stellar performances by students from all over RUSD. I was so impressed to see the dedication uh, to keep their language and their culture and their practices alive to their next generation. Um, there was a, a coming together from all people all over the community of Riverside. They were sharing resources and being supportive of one another. It was very beautiful and I was very proud of our students. Uh, thank you to the parent leaders that had the vision to put this on for the community. Your dedication really paid off. A los padres de familia, gracias por apoyar a sus hijos. Y a los líderes de la comunidad, la señora Fernández y su equipo, felicidades. Lograron un, su visión de celebrar nuestra herencia latina y lo hicieron muy bien. Anticipo la celebración del próximo año. Thank you to Ms. Hill and to all of the RUSD teachers and staff that supported our parents and our students that night. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander, <laughs> Trustee Lee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Farouk. Yeah, just briefly grateful to be here, grateful for all of those that participate in public input and that will participate in this meeting today. Um, glad, Mr. Hunt, you're back with us this evening. I'm um, glad to see that 11 days in the hospital and a little oxygen didn't stop you from sharing your always your wisdom from uh, from your, your viewpoint in our board member comments. So glad to see you here and glad to have you back. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Uh, Trustee Kinnear. Thank you. Uh, I want to respond to, to uni teachers, uh, those that spoke tonight, those that uh, wrote us uh, emails this week, and uh, those that, uh, that I've spoken to on, on the phone. You know, I'm, I'm deeply troubled, as, as you are, by the fact that any staff member, uh, and even more so a group of staff members, believe that safety is not an important concern to the people that lead this district. It's far from the truth. Oh. We as, as district leaders need to fix this problem immediately and everyone is, is hurt when, when staff members believe that the district doesn't care and we, we do care. I appreciate you holding us accountable and we'll respond to, to, to that accountability. I can assure everyone and I know my colleagues believe the same that we will do everything we can to deal uh, effectively with the growing uh, threat to student and staff safety. Uh, we'll be there for you. Thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh, I want to echo the sentiments of my colleagues to a uni a family here. Uh, I, I think it's, it's deeply concerning uh, to me and to all of us uh, for you to, again, not only feel safe, but, but be safe. And so I know that this has been a topic that's been brought up around the whole district and we've been putting together plans and uh, uh, appropriating additional resources on campus supervisors and so forth, but clearly it's, it's not sufficient. And so uh, I want you to know we're, as Trustee Kinnear and, and others have mentioned, we are evaluating what additional tools and resources we have to, to be supportive. I know uh, some of you brought up very specific uh, policy suggestions, so we want to evaluate what's within the parameters of what the Ed Code and the, uh, and the state would allow on that. Um, one thing I will say that's a specific thing that uh, was discussed with Superintendent Hill also is the administrative hearing uh, panels that over, provide oversight on discipline. We want to make sure that uh, we look at best practices and training efforts to ensure that they are uh, you know, fully informed on the decisions that they're making as well. I'm actually, before I conclude my remarks, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Superintendent Hill. So generally, all the public input staff do follow up uh, on those matters, but I wanted to, uh, Superintendent Hill to speak specifically about some of the evaluation on uni. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, so when I, I talk more with um, Principal Grimble than I did with some, in, some um, email exchanges with teachers and then um, like one of the teachers said, Deputy Superintendent Walker was at uni yesterday and then um, another couple of staff members and I couldn't be there today so um, Chief of Staff Thaxton went on my behalf um, and have now, it was a long time ago, but having taught at Longfellow, um, uh, I have some of the flavor of uni students because just for, um, 
right way to say it, to help support my previous Longfellow students at uni. There were times when I would go to uni to help work it out. <laughs> um, and so um, I think Dr. NHA said, you know, uni teachers, we stand with you. I know you feel a, a gap in that care right now. Um, and we will all endeavor to, to support you in some of the specific things that you mentioned um, and following up on your, your care and needs. Um, for example, I know you had asked about a diversion pro program uh, and the teacher mentioned it today. Uh, and there wasn't one, we did a lot of work last year to try to find one. And as I talked to Principal Grimble today, I think we're gonna have to make one that suits us um, and I'm here for it. We can, we can work on that um, and make it and work down, down your list of suggestions so that um, as Principal Grimble said, you have more tools and strategies um, to work with and, and resources that we provide to uni. Um, as you know, district-wide, we've been working on behavior and discipline um, and I recognize that it's not a, a one size fits all. You know, the, the certain context, certain situations, certain times, particular students might need um, a specific strategy or tool that's not already in our toolkit. So um, this governance team for sure and the, the cabinet team are willing and ready to work with you to fashion those solutions that work. Thank you, Superintendent Hill. And uh, we're very f fortunate. Uh, as you said, one, this is a district-wide uh, priority, but uh, as you said, uh, wherever there can be, given the context of whatever the dynamics are, uh, to provide uh, specialized solutions, that's important. And, and you're- if, if, if I may add please, one little bit too. Um, and really, really to everyone, um, as I just want you to know that as I do my work, I regularly update the board. So um, when you talk to me, I communicate that to them. So I want you just to know that that, that flow is there, even if I don't particularly tell you that I talk to the board about that, I talk to them about everything. <laughs> so um, it, with that flow of communication, they're in it regularly. When you send them an email and you get a response from me, they know what the response is. And m many times they have input to the response and direction for the, for the response. Um, but just to, to keep a unified answer, typically staff will respond, not the board. Thank you for pro providing that context. And uh, th your experience is coming in from the uni uh, pipeline is, is invaluable in this as well, so thank you for that. Um, the, the last thing I'll just say too is uh, to echo Dr. Hernandez Alexander, who represented the board uh, very honorably at that event, uh, just to wish everyone a great Hispanic Heritage Month. So th thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll now proceed to our consent calendar. Uh, these items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the board vote unless members of the board request to have specific items removed from the consent calendar. Uh, Trustee Hunt, do we have any input on this item? President Farouk, we do not. Okay. Uh, I now turn to the board. If there's any items that anyone would like to pull before we vote on consent items uh, I-1 through I-14. Okay. Student board member Odera, would you want to consider making a motion? Uh, yes. I would like to make a motion to approve uh, consent calendar items um, I-1 through I-3 and um item I-14. Okay. So I-1 through I-13, omitting item uh, 14. Do we have a second? Second by Trustee Lee. Please vote. We did check. There was no public comment. It looks like there's some kind of air on my... Okay, if we can do a, a, a roll call vote, student board, board member Odera. How do you vote? Aye. Trustee Lee? Aye. Trustee Kinnear? Aye. Dr. Hernandez-Alexander? Aye. Trustee Hunt? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. We'll uh, now entertain a motion for I-14, the omitted item. I move to approve I-14. 
Motion by Trustee Kinnear. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Is, is it working now or we still do the? Okay, so uh, uh, student board member Adara, how do you vote? Aye. You're abstaining on this one, right? Yes, I'm abstaining. It's a, yeah. it's a um, yeah. uh, personnel issue, and that's the reason uh, yeah. for those that are wondering. Uh, tr Trustee Lee? Aye. Trustee Kinnear? Aye. Dr. Hernandez Alexander? Aye. Trustee Hunt? Aye. And I vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. So that concludes our consent calendar. We'll turn to public hearing now regarding pupil textbook and instructional materials compliance for the fiscal year 2023-2024. This time, I'll open the public hearing at 6.50 p.m. Uh, and ask that any members of the public who wish to address the board on this item, please provide a public input speaker card, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Sosa. Thank you, and good evening, Dr. Farouk, Ms. Hill, and members of the board. As a condition of receiving instructional materials funds under California Education Code, Section 60119, the Riverside Unified School District must hold a public hearing within the first eight weeks of school to determine through a resolution whether every student has sufficient and appropriate textbooks or instructional materials in the areas of mathematics, science, uh, history, social science, foreign language, English language arts, and English language development. That can uh, yes, I believe we need to ask if there's any public input. Okay. So, T Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input? We have one uh, request, Dr. Okay. Uh, Ms. S Sandy R. Ms. R, welcome. You have three minutes. First, I'd like to say I was very sorry to hear the news, Mr. Hunt. Um, I've told you before that we pray for you. There's a group of us. We all pray for this entire board because it's easy to pray for the people that you love and agree with, and sometimes it's not as easy to pray for the people that you disagree with. So I pray for you every night, and I have for a long time. So just wanted to say that first. Um, the reason I'm talking about this is because AB 1078 passed. And that was one of the bills that we were fighting, that we were very much against, that Corey Jackson authored, somebody that you're familiar with, you're familiar with, I've seen them at your campaign events, and it's not somebody that we support. We wanted local control. Even though this board is pretty much doing anything Sacramento wants, we still wanted to have local control. So that if we could miraculously flip some seats and get some conservatives, at least one conservative that could maybe debate a topic, um, that would have been great. Um, so now with not having local control, what does this mean? Are you just going to get given like three choices from the state and pick which one and there's not, not any control? Parents can't now come and, you know, have an issue with the curriculum or with the books. Or, so I'd like an explanation as part of this public comment as how this is going to affect this going forward now that AB 1078 has passed. Now, you never know. I mean, it might be found unconstitutional and get flipped like he just flipped and recalled the last policy that he passed less than a year ago. Um, so we're still hopeful for that. But again, I'd like an explanation as to how AB 1078 is going to affect this and why you guys were not more vocal in opposition to AB 1078 as somebody whose power has basically been taken away. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. R. That concludes our... Uh, public input portion of the public hearing. Uh, so at this time, after hearing the presentation by staff and comments from members of the community, I'm going to close the public hearing at 6.54 p.m. And thank you to those who participated. Now we proceed to the action portion ac accompanying this uh, public hearing, which is a uh, recommendation for the board to consider adopting resolution 2023-2024 at dash 46 regarding pupil textbook and instructional materials compliance for the fiscal year 2023-2024, Dr. Sosa. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve resolution 2023-24-46, pupil textbooks and instructional materials compliance for fiscal year 2023-24, which indicates we are in compliance and have sufficient textbooks or instructional materials for this academic year. 
Thank you, Dr. Sosa. The board can deliberate during the action portion of this agenda, but we can uh, again uh, entertain public input on this item. Do we have any public input? Okay. So now our, our board can uh, d deliberate on this. Trustee Lee, did you have any comments? I was just going to make a motion to approve. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion on the floor? Dr. Hernandez Alexander, please proceed. Dr. Sosa, I just have a question as to how textbooks um, are generally purchased. So, so, not purchased, but if we're saying that students should have one, uh, am I oversimplifying it? Two textbooks, essentially, where, where one they could use at the school and one they could use at home? Is that, is that not it? The education code requires that students have access to a textbook uh, when they're in their classroom and that they can take home. Okay. So we have both um, hard-backed textbooks in the classroom, and we also have every student has access to a digital version on their district-provided Chromebook. That's what I was going to ask you. So it's, have we essentially moved to all digital to where the, we're, act, we're taking care of that by the fact that it's all on their Google Chromebook? We haven't officially moved, per se, to that. Okay. We still do have paperback textbooks right. for students that need it and for those uh, those occasions when perhaps Wi-Fi service may not be the best at a, a child's home or um, if there's a Wi-Fi outage, we always have those books. Publishers do tend to provide now both copies. Oh. When you buy the paper copy, you get the digital copy as well. That's something we negotiate when we purchase. That's great. So then if there is an, a neurodiverse student who needs a paper copy, mm -hmm. we would be able to get one quickly or it's already available. Yes, ma'am. It's available for the student. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez Alexander. Trustee Hunt. Dr. Sosa, I'm just, I've always been impressed, which is using a nice word, how much the publishers have control over California e education. But does our resolution, unless I missed it, uh, does it also apply to online learning that where a textbook has been substituted by a, online? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. This uh, resolution covers all the modalities or the ways that we have school, both in-person school and virtual. Thank you, Trustee Hunt. Uh, did you have a question? No, I, I don't think there was a second, so. Uh, okay, I'll I, I just had one okay. quick question. Uh, I know there's been a concerted effort to get more uh, diverse perspectives and, uh, in, in our textbooks. Is that reflecting in, in, in these efforts that you're doing? Uh, yes, in our adoption efforts, we do use as one of our guiding principles to make sure that the textbooks comply with the FAIR Act, uh, which is a uh, state law that requires uh, to have diverse perspectives in all materials that are adopted in the state of California and all of our textbooks do um, align with the FAIR Act. This particular resolution and process is about sufficiency. Do we have the, the adequate number for that? Not necessarily in the, uh, the acquisition Absolutely. or the adoption of that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sosa. So we have a motion by uh, Trustee Lee, seconded by Trustee Kinnear. Please vote. It's not, okay. So student board member Odero. Aye. Trustee Lee? Aye. Trustee Kinnear? Aye. Dr. Hernandez Alexander? Aye. Trustee Hunt? And I vote aye. The motion carries unanimously. I think they just fixed it. Aye, so yeah, we can I see that. We can, it's already been voted on. Yeah, uh, we can do so, it the next thing. Uh, our next action item is regarding a recommendation for approval of resolution number 2023-2024-47, our district of choice attendance program space availability. Mr. Walker, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you, Dr. Frug, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Hill. Uh, tonight, you're going to get a quick little overview of the 24-25 district of choice uh, program. Uh, many of you have uh, heard this every year, as this is a requirement for us to take action through a resolution um, prior to us going out and having our open enrollment. Uh, so the Education Code uh, 48300 through 48316 uh, has uh, quite a bit of information on the District of Choice program. Uh, you, as you will recall, in 2010, we took action as a district and you took action as a board to create the District of Choice program in RUSD. 
It's available for school-age students who do not live within the boundaries of RUSD, and it, uh, DOC is for entry into the district, not the selection of a desired school. And SB 680 uh, requires district to accept all applicants uh, based on the number of openings that we declare. Um, so we'll get a little bit more information on that in a minute. The district of choice must determine the number of transfer students it is willing to accept for each uh, school level and ensure the students are admitted, uh, selected through a random, unbiased process. So if we have more students apply than we have, let's say, at the elementary level, we would do an un, uh, uh, unbiased uh, lottery system. And uh, if we had 300 students and 400 apply, uh, th 300 would get in. We would accept all of those. The admission process prohibits the evaluation of whether or not a student should be enrolled based on their academic, athletic, physical condition, or their proficiency in English. Here's a little um, graph that shows the year-by-year -year comparison uh, for clarification purposes. Uh, one of the board members asked, what does this represent? This represents the number of applications that we received in that particular year. So this goes back to 2016-17 where we had 517 applications. And uh, for 2021, we had 671. Th uh, last year, 23, 24, for this current school year, we had 401. Remember that we're already winding up to do the transfer process for open enrollment starting in November. The 24-25 recommendations for the DOC application recommendation is 300 spaces for each level for elementary, middle, and high school, with a maximum number of 900. We recommend that the Board of Education certify the DOC spaces available for the November 1, 23 through January 12, 24 application window. Um, as an added uh, graph, we wanted to provide for you the 24-25 transfer windows for all of the different transfer options that we have in RUSD. You can see that the majority of them run from November 1st to January the 12th. There are a few that require uh, an earlier completion, so something like the engineering program, uh, Project Lead the Way at uh, Martin Luther King High School. They have the, each one of these is a separate transfer process. So they have their own transfer paperwork. Um, and that one ends on December the 8th. You'll see another one on December 22nd for a DLI. Um, those just are required in order for them to do their own internal uh, lottery if they have more students apply to that, pro uh, that program be before they get it to us so we can do the transfer paperwork. Um, so the resolution that's before you tonight is to declare ourselves once again as a district of choice, resolution 23-24-47, and with uh, 300 at each level of elementary, middle, and high school. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input on this item? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Does anybody have any comments or questions from the board? The Trustee Liu? A question for Superintendent, uh, Deputy Superintendent Walker. On these uh, time frames, have any of them been modified from last year, the windows? Um, they haven't been modified from last year, but we have made sure that the RVS uh, timeline is uh, articulated um, because they are their own school now. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, Trustee Hunt. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, I just want to say I know that we adopted dual uh, I mean, this transfer uh, enrollment back in... 2010. 2010 under Dr. Miller. I still think it's one of the finest strategic moves this district has ever made. Again, back to my hospital reading, I was uh, interested to find that today in America, there are 600,000 less five-year-old and under children than there was just 25 years ago and so declining enrollment you know outside of a few spots like Beaumont is a fact everywhere so we have a good education uh, offering here at district I think it's uh, and I know already you're going to be supportive but it's incumbent that we we make sure we adopt this and approve it thank you Mr. Walker for your report thank you trustee Hunt trustee Kinnear 
you know, I, I recognize that this isn't a presentation on, en on enrollment projections or, or the budget. Uh, however, should we be concerned about declining district of choice applications that are being made? We see that dramatic drop in, in applications. Uh, is, uh, is that, uh, uh, should that be a concern of, of ours? Um, I think globally, because uh, the District of Choice program is in a number of districts now, we, we are getting the number of um, parents who are interested in coming to our USD. What we also are getting is uh, all along parents who are previously here on an inter-district transfer where you have to reapply with all of the paperwork be released from the other district each year as you transition from grade to grade, the district of choice program allows you to apply once and if accepted by the district of, of RUSD for the DOC transfer in first grade, kindergarten, you are allowed to transition all the way through the 12th grade. We assign you to a school at elementary, we assign you to a school at middle, we assign you a school to high school, and if you are desiring to stay and to graduate from RUSD, you do not have to fill out any paperwork after you do it the first time. Also, they do not have to be released by their district of residence. We just notify the district of residence that they have applied for and been accepted for a district of choice transfer, and they come here without the um, burdensome act of having to be released by the district prior to applying for a transfer. Okay. Uh, with, the, with the reasons for the decline, uh, are, is, are there, are, because of the decline in, in, uh, in the, these applications, are we going to see a change in how we're estimating enrollment uh, in the future? We does, not, does this affect yeah, our enrollment projections? We, we did not see a uh, reduction, and I, I can defer to, um, to Aaron, uh, uh, doc, uh, Assistant Superintendent Power, to, to give a little bit of information, but I don't believe that our projections were vastly affected by the DOC uh, numbers uh, specifically in our projections for this year. Thank you, uh, Mr. Walker. I would say that the enrollment projections do take into consideration transfers into the district uh, because they're based on trends. And um, so if the transfers coming in are less, now that's just one piece, the district of choice, as Mr. Walker noted, there's inter-district transfers that aren't district of choice. Um, so overall, the number of transfers, if it goes down, that would build into the trends to impact future enrollment projections. Okay. Thank you. Student Board Member Odero. Um, I had a question about the um, capacity of the dual language immersion programs. So um, let's say um, for elementary school, a parent wanted to enroll their child in a dual language immersion program, uh, but it was at capacity does that child still go to the elementary school or um, do they go to a different elementary school that doesn't have a dual language? Um, if they're coming in for DOC? Yeah, or they're if they're the, coming in for a regular transfer? They're in the district, they're in the district. Oh, okay, so th that's a different uh, question related to what the presentation is, but to answer your question, the DLI program or the dual language and immersion program has a lottery system for parents that uh, they demonstrate and, and express their interest in getting into the program. All of those uh, parents, there's a certain number of kids that can come into the grade levels. They all go into in a, a lottery system. And then they also have, that's one of the few uh, programs that has a wait list. So you, if you get in, you go to the program and you start to progress through the years. And if you don't get in and someone ends up leaving the program, then they go to that wait list and they ask if you would like to come in at that point in time. Otherwise, you would attend your home school or your school of residence unless you apply for a transfer after you did not get into the DLI program and it's within the same period of time um, where the, uh, we still do transfers, you could apply to go to another school if you, if you desire to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can entertain a motion. I move to approve. Motion by Trustee Kinnear, second by Trustee Hunt. Can we, okay, we can vote. Okay, the motion carries unanimous.
we are going to take a, a 10 minute uh, recess actually to 7.20 uh, and reconvene at that point. Thank you.
We are proceeding to the reports discussion portion of the agenda, uh, beginning with a report on the dual language immersion program at our school district, which is a presentation that will be led by Assistant Superintendent Dr. Dan Sosa. Thank you very much, and a good evening again, Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and board members. I am very pleased this evening to be sharing an update on our dual language immersion program, or what we call DLI. The purpose of tonight's presentation will be twofold. First, I'll be providing an overview of our DLI program. We would also like to get the board's feedback and input regarding a number of considerations our team's been working on for the possible design of the program at North High School. Specifically, we will be reviewing school sites where DLI is present and the students we serve in the program. We'll be looking at program goals and pathways at each grade span. We'll review a few key metrics and talk about some highlights. And then I'll briefly uh, explore some considerations for that program entering North High School and we'll end with a discussion by the board if the board so desires. We are very proud to share that six of our elementary schools house DLI programs. And at the secondary level, we have DLI programs offered at three middle schools. The district has just opened a DLI program at University Heights Middle School this year. We also have the program currently at two comprehensive high schools, which you can see on the screen. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, we'll discuss the considerations for opening a program at North in the 2025-26 school year. The racial and ethnic makeup of the students in DLI program can be seen on the screen. You can also see the educational program participation for our DLI students. 62% of our families identify as low socioeconomic. 32% of our families identify, or excuse me, our students are English language learners and 5% participate in general education. Excuse me, special education. <laughs> our DLI program has been designed with three core principles or goals in mind. First is bilingualism and biliteracy. Our program believes that both English and Spanish are equally prestigious and important languages as they are world languages. And we strive to help students gain mastery in both languages. Next is academic achievement. Our teachers provide high quality and rigorous instruction in two languages and they all hold very high expectations for their students to achieve academic success within both languages. And finally, social, excuse me, sociocultural competence. Our program is not only focused on helping students achieve academic mastery at high levels, but it is also to develop their understanding of the rich cultures of peoples who speak Spanish. That is all across the world. The program values cultures, languages, and views of diversity as an asset. So let's review the language pathways for our elementary schools. For our DLI programs at elementary school, we start kindergarten with 90% of students getting instruction in Spanish and 10% of the time they're getting instruction in English. The classes are balanced between native English speakers and native Spanish speakers. This community of learners grows together throughout the years as a cohort as they go through school. And as you can see, the percentage of instruction in English will increase over the elementary years, getting to 50% Spanish and 50% English by the time they enter grades four through six. One interesting fact that I'd like to share is in addition to learning the Spanish language, Mathematics and either science or social studies are taught exclusively in Spanish within the elementary pathway. So this method helps students to deepen their academic understanding of the Spanish language. Within our middle schools, we see that 
DLI students switch from having um, instruction partially in a language to having an entire course taught in a Spanish language. This leads our students to be able to take the Spanish language advanced placement or AP exam when they are in eighth grade. Students in the middle schools take both history and science in Spanish when they're there. For students to be able to have the opportunity to have other courses within their day, the middle schools offer a zero period PE. So in other words, students come before first period to take PE, which opens up a space in their schedule to be involved in other activities at their middle school, such as band or AVID or choir or robotics or something else that they might have. CTE, for example, at their middle schools. Now we'll take a look at the pathway in high school you see that students take world language, excuse me, world history in Spanish in the ninth grade uh, at both schools, Ramona and Poly. And at Ramona, students have the option to take biology in Spanish in ninth grade as well. For 10th grade, students take their second AP or advanced placement Spanish course, that's advanced placement literature that will uh, complete the advanced placement series for the language of Spanish. Juniors take US history in Spanish. The pathway ends with our A through G approved translation certificate course. This course is now a college level course and students can earn up to three college units by earning a grade of a B or better. Students can also explore some additional courses in Spanish if they would like, which are listed there on the screen. Next, we'll see our program enrollment figures over the last three years. When we review these enrollment trends, we see that overall the enrollment in the program has increased by over 400 students from the 2021-22 school year to the 2022-23 school year. Persistence in the program, or other words, students staying within DLI from a grade span to grade span is somewhat increasing as you can see as we go up through the years. And although we see a decrease in new enrollments in the primary grades, uh, that's one of the trends we're starting to see. So in grades kinder through three, we have slightly fewer students than we had last year. We are monitoring this as well as the school site principles of which DLI is at their school. Next, we'll take a look at some summative data metrics from our CASP and our LPAC assessments. This slide displays a comparison of student performance on the state's end of year assessment in English language arts and mathematics. You'll see much more of these results at the next board meeting. Overall, scores on CASP English Language Arts show that DLI students scored more favorably than their non-DLI peers in English Language Arts for both 21-22 and the 22-23 preliminary data for met or exceeded standards. The same can also be said for mathematics. We see that the overall scores in math show that DLI students scored more favorably than non-DLI students in the 21-22 and in the preliminary 22-23 school year than compared to their non-DLI peers. This slide displays a comparison of student performance on the state's end of year language assessment given to all English language learners. We often refer to this as the LPAC or the English Learner Proficiency Assessment for California. You'll also see much more about these scores at the November board meeting. Scores show that DLI students had a higher percentage of them who scored in levels three and four in both the 21-22 school year and the 22-23 school year than their non-DLI peers. You will recall that scoring a four on the LPAC is one of the requirements for reclassification from an English language learner to a fully English proficient student. There have been a number of exciting highlights to share with the board and community. 
Last year, we celebrated our first DLI cohort to graduate from high school. That picture that's there on the right is, is a, uh, just a snapshot of the group as they were at their um, recognition ceremony at Grant Education Center. These scholars began their DLI career as kindergartners at Washington Elementary School. We had over 40 students finish their DLI career. They started 13 years ago all together at Washington. It was exciting to see. They even performed a song they did as sixth graders, again as 12th graders, and it brought uh, the parents and the onlookers to tears. It was really a moving experience. The capstone course for DLI, the translator certificate, debuted last year for this group of scholars. This is the first time RUSD has offered such a course. Students completing these courses are certified to translate in many professional settings, and they could even get a job as a substitute translator here if that opportunity presented itself. For the 23-24 school year, as I mentioned a little earlier, the course is now articulated with Moreno Valley College. It's what we call an articulated course. So. <clears throat> Students who receive a grade of B or higher can earn up to three college units for completing this course. <clears throat> Excuse. Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Walker. DLI has expanded to 11 schools within the district. This year, we have students that are beginning in a cohort at University Heights Middle School in grade seven. And finally, we're proud of the partnership that we have with our Somos DLI parent group. This is a group of DLI parents who have organized to support the program throughout the district. Very recently, Somos DLI and the district collaborated to host a concert with a national renowned recording group, uh, Uno, Dos, Tres, Andres to entertain and teach our youngest DLI students. It really was a fun event at Ramona in August. And as I wrap up this evening, I wanted to spend a few moments speaking about the future growth of DLI. Now that we have students beginning at University Heights Middle School, it's an appropriate time to get the board's thoughts and feedback on a few critical areas that our team has been considering for the DLI program at North. I'd like to take just a moment to emphasize that we still have many, many different educational partners to engage with and speak with, and no decision has been made as of today for what the program might look like at North. We're still in that gathering of information phase. There are five main areas of consideration our team has been identifying, and I'll speak on each of them. The program at North would be fed from University Heights Middle School as would be expected. Uni has two elementary schools that feed into its DLI program, Fremont and Longfellow. This year, Longfellow sent students to DLI as Fremont only had a fifth grade class last year. They now have a sixth grade class, so going into next year, we will have two cohorts of classes going into University Heights Middle School. We will have to keep a close eye on the enrollment numbers at each of those schools to get an idea of how many students might matriculate into John W. North. North has a proud tradition of being an international baccalaureate high school. This program attracts students from all over RUSD, DLI and non-DLI students alike. We need to consider the possibility and what it might look like of DLI and IB coexisting on the same campus. We need to dig into that, talk to the staff at North High School and uh, get their feedback on what that might look like. As part of the DLI program, North is the only school to offer Chinese. We need to consider how it might work to have an intensive study of Chinese and Spanish happening on the same campus. Just what would the dynamics be like to have two uh, world language that have an intensified level of study? 
North is also very fortunate to have three partnership academies on campus as well as the International Baccalaureate program. These four programs have an impact on the master schedule and on staffing. So we need to consider what the impact might be, if anything, of adding another specialty program onto the campus and what that might look like. The final area we have identified for consideration is the system as a whole. We need to study what impact, if any, adding another DLI to a comprehensive high school might have on the system. There may be no impact at all, but we need to ask ourselves and our stakeholders the questions on what that impact might possibly be. And with that, I've concluded. We'll take any public comment and have any discussion if the board would desire. Thank you, Dr. Sosa. Trustee Hunt, do we have any public input on this item? President Farouk, we do not. Okay, uh, we'll start with you. you. You wanted to... You know, I came on this board uh, in November 2007. And I was, you know, I already knew about it, but I was put back that uh, our district did not have DLI, where Corona Norco had had it for 12 years and Alford had it for 10. Not to despair, but one of my colleagues had been president 10 years before and was quoted in the paper when she when the colleague was asked about uh, RUST and she said uh, quote I think if we're going to test test them in English we should teach them in English which I found uh, uh, to not only be xenophobic particularly but also to be racially biased but I'm very, very proud of this program. Let me ask you, I support it going to North, and as you mentioned, Chinese. So I'm, a, I'm an incoming freshman, and uh, I didn't take DLI, and I'm not bilingual uh, by inherency. Uh, can I still get in the program? Can that student still get in the program, even though they didn't do it at uni and Fremont prior? Currently, the program design has students coming in through the whole series, but that is definitely something that we have been asking ourselves. Do we need to work in other uh, on-ramps, you might say, for students to enter? Well, I, I would encourage you to look at that because if a freshman can come in and say, I'm going to take Mandarin, uh, not the easiest language there is, but... Uh, Certainly, in a global economy, uh, I would like to see their career tech kids having opportunities as well, because we have law enforcement at North, certainly in this region, uh, bilingual, uh, and we have nursing. So I would be interested in, in that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Hunt, Student Board Member O'Dara. I'm not, I have a question about um, students, about the students who take the LPAC mm -hmm. and then they get to level four. When is the LPAC given? In the, in the springtime, around the same time that the CASP assessment is being given. And that's like, um, that would be like someone's eighth grade year or someone's uh, junior year or? For students who are English language learners, they they must be assessed with LPAC every year up until the time that they earn reclassification or they meet the criteria, I should say. That's a better description for uh, reclassification. Okay. And then when they, um, they're they reclassified, they reach level four, um, they're still in the dual language immersion program. Uh, yes. Those two are separate, correct? So they could be what we would call a reclassified fully proficient student still within DLI and then um, looking at the classes offered are they um, are they limited to those classes only like they're only limited to world history uh, let's say someone wanted to take uh, I don't know AP world history or like AP euro or they wanted to take um, a different class are they just limited to those classes if they're in the program not at all students can decide to take any class that they would like just uh, 
the classes I listed are taught in Spanish, okay. though. Yeah, but if a student wanted to take, or their family wanted them to take a push, AP US history, they absolutely could. There's no problem with that. Okay. And then um, my last question is that I was looking at the demographics, and the demographics are primarily Hispanics. Is there um, is there a push to get uh, other demographics into the DLI program, and can that work? 100%, absolutely. We recruit as a district and uh, principals um, actively recruit. In fact, the uh, Uno, Dos, Tres, Andres event was also a recruitment event as much as it was a concert for our current students to be able to, to get folks interested in that. One of the reasons we see so many um, or the uh, percentage of students be Hispanic is because the design of the program is 50% English and 50% Spanish. Well over 95% of our students who speak Spanish as their first language are Hispanic as well. And then um, going back into integrating people who aren't uh, Spanish speakers, that, that's not their first language or it's not like a home language. I noticed that in the beginning of the dual language uh, program that it is 90% Spanish first. So would the integration of non-native speakers, would that happen not K through three, but like later on when it becomes 50-50 or? Um... No, they start at day one in kindergarten hearing 90% Spanish. So uh, complete. It's a complete immersion at that okay. point for our kindergarten students. Uh, Mr. Lee can probably <laughs> speak very well to that having students who were in DLI. Okay, uh, that's all my questions, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Student Board Member Ardera, Superintendent Hill. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, I just wanted to articulate a subtlety <clears throat> that I think Dr. Sosa alluded to, um, but I just put a put a finer point on it, and Trustee Irene just hit on it. Um, and and to your question, Mr. Hunt, there's a difference of expected outcome with world language instruction versus immersion instruction. So world language, like we all took in high school, you enter high school and you take a language, you're gonna leave with a certain level of proficiency. Um, but for DLI, the outcome is expected that they are fully biliterate, read, write, speak, and listen in both languages with um, a plum. There you go. That's a million dollar word for you. Um, so entry during the high school years would have, students would have to be screened pretty strenuously. Um, not that it couldn't be done, but in order to have that same level of biliteracy, students would have to be screened pretty strenuously, I think. Thank you, Superintendent. To receive the certificate. That's an actual course. Okay. So even theoretically, non-DLI students could take the course if they wanted to. Oh, they to. could? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, that's good. I did, yes. That was going to be my next question as we're talking about what the possibilities are. So, so then my follow-up question to that would be, can a student that feels fairly proficient bilingually, could they test, could, could there be an opportunity for a conversation to say, maybe someone can test into the DLI program in high school? There's definitely room for that conversation, yes. Okay. But th we're currently not, that's not the practice. We're only taking those that are coming in from middle school. DLI yes, ma'am. That okay. is the current program design. But again, we have been um, ideating and discussing what are ways we can grow the program, uh, taking into account our current reality, and that is something we have discussed. Is it accurate that um, students kind of drop off around middle schoolish, high schoolish time? If you're going to get a drop off, is it around that time? We do see a little bit of an attrition from sixth to seventh grade and from eighth to ninth grade. Um, we're going to study that more directly because I'm a curious guy having been in the Ray office and would like to know a little bit more about why that is. But from what we have been learning anecdotally, 
when students transition to to those larger schools, there are a whole variety of options yeah. of things for them to do. <laughs> and it's very, very exciting. And that's really what those schools are meant to do, right? Provide options for students to begin to expand their thinking of what they could be and want to do when they grow up. And so I don't think we should take it as any kind of an indictment on DLI whatsoever that there's anything wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just student interest and family interest change over time. And some of them feel like they've got the foundational skills and they want to move on to engineering or do something that else. That could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my next question is on slide 12. Um, it's where we're comparing uh, CASP results. What would you say, what would you attribute the percentage differences between the DLI and the district-wide um, results between the two? Like why, would, why is DLI higher in language um, arts? Uh, that's a good question. I think one of the one of the realities is DLI is a self-selected program. Mm -hmm. uh, parents and families and students self-select to be able to uh, be or have that opportunity. Um, what we typically find, not just in this program, but any self-selected program, that tends to increase motivation, persistence, and all of those things that uh, do tend to be positive. Um, attributes to helping to increase learning and so having that self-selected piece could be one of those we also know that there's brain research that says as a student or as a human being acquires another language they have diff that their cognition changes and increases right it increases brain function we, kind of similar to what uh, the argument is about why VAPA and music is so good for math Right, as a student learns how to play an instrument and understands in their brain, starts to rewire to know how to play music, there's a mathematics connection as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a similar research base for language as there is for VAPA and music on that. Um, I'm not an expert in that, so I can't say for sure. I'm just familiar with that. That's fascinating. Um, my last question is, can you explain um, how the LPAC results interact with DLI students that may be native English speakers taking DLI? Does that question make sense? Uh, yes, but a native English speaker who is in DLI would not have to take the LPAC. It's only a student who takes the initial, uh, well, all of these kids would have taken the LPAC. The initial LPAC because they were identified as having a language other than English on their home language oh. survey. Okay, so these are DLI students who are also English learners. That is correct. Got it. Okay. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hernandez. Alexander, Trustee Lee. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Um, thank you, Dr. Sosa. Uh, so I do have a few questions. I think first I'll start by saying, like, I, I don't, I don't think there's, a, at least in my opinion, a, a better bright spot than, than this program in our district, just because of the, the, um, the reach that it has. That you know, not anywhere in the city, but for the most part, anywhere in the city, um, students can participate in this program if they want. Uh, and, and now that it's been around for going on 14 years, you know, we have good data to show um, the success that students who participate in the program can experience, um, not only through, through test scores and student achievement, uh, reclassifying our, our English learners, um, but the whole um, uh, cultural proficiency uh, and, and just being uh, you know, better, better citizen and being more respectful and aware of other things uh, around you. Um, so I mean, you, you know, Mr. Hutton, I can fight about who's the who's the bigger cheerleader of this program. Uh, he's got me on longevity because he's been on the board longer. Um, but I've had three students and have two currently that are still in this program, uh, and just can't say enough good things about it. Um, with that, I do have a, a couple questions. Um, the first having to do on slide five with kind of the breakdown, um, more in terms of un, a race and ethnicity. Uh, and you kind of uh, gave some, uh, some opinion about why the, the numbers uh, are what they are, especially because when students start uh, in the program, 50% should be native Spanish speakers. So you're gonna have a, a higher proportion of students uh, of Hispanic origin in the program. Um, however, I think it also is an opportunity for us to maybe re-examine our recruiting efforts um, so that regardless of what ethnicity a student is, 
they know that there's an opportunity for them to engage in this program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we don't know what we don't know. Uh, so we have to, we have to, we have to uh, receive the information in a way that we can understand it and see if it's a good fit for our family. Um, and I feel, uh, uh, just looking at the numbers, it just seems a little bit too off um, that, that maybe we need to look at our recruiting efforts and just, and just see if there's any retooling that we could do um, to maybe engage some of these unrepresented groups, uh, specifically Asian and African American, um, to, to make sure that th those families know that uh, this is an option for them that they can be successful at. Um, so that'd be one one suggestion. Um, no, that's a great suggestion. I appreciate that. The uh, other question I had was in regards to the CASP assessment. Um, we've seen, um, you know, since the beginning of the program that the, the DLI cohort have outperformed non-DLI cohort, regardless of grade level. Um, so I see we're just reflecting CASP scores here, and we're not breaking it down. Um, by grade or over a, a length of time. So I'd be interested in seeing that information um, by grade level uh, and also over time um, and maybe see how COVID has impacted those numbers and if that's kind of closed the gap between the two cohorts because I feel like it's a little bit closer than it has been in years past. Uh, and I think it would be important to see by grade level to these numbers because I think that can tell, uh, tell the story about uh, what's happening. We can provide that in a mail out. We'd be happy to. Okay, great. Um, and then my next is more of a, a reflection on, on my recollection of this program as how it's progressed and grown over the years. And the last time I remember the board having a discussion and providing direction uh, to staff in regards to the growth of the program was there was this fear that um, to keep the integrity of the program and realizing there is a finite number of, of educators out there and even more finite number of B-clad educators out there that can teach in this program. That we didn't want to have the program suffer from either lack of being able to find uh, teachers um, or not being having, having our pick of the teachers that we would want to teach in our classrooms just because they have a B-clad, right? Um, we don't want to sacrifice uh, excellence just, just for that. So at the time, I remember the, the goal was as we grew, we were going to have, uh, you know, seven elementary schools, go to two middle schools, Gage and uh, Sierra, and then those two would feed, in, feed into Poly, right? And now I realize, uh, you know, we have it at three middle schools and um, two, how many high schools? Two high schools, with two. potentially considering, considering three. Um, and I don't recall having a discussion about that with the board. So um, either I'm either I forgot, um, or staff wanted uh, for for whatever reason decided to grow the program beyond those original designated schools. Um, for well, I don't know for whatever reason, maybe population wise or just accommodation wise. So one, does anybody remember that besides me? Um, two, are we able to attract the teachers that we need for the classroom? Um, and, and, and three, are we having enough participation uh, at the school set where we're able to fill classrooms efficiently and run the program as it was designed? I know those were lots of questions, but. Okay. I will try and take them. I've been waiting for this presentation for a year, so. <laughs> yeah. I will try and I take them. Um, I think and I realize you were not in this seat right. or the seat that you had before when these decisions were made. Right. Um, so in terms of what the thinking was of why we expanded outside, I would have to do more research on that, and I'd be happy to provide that. I don't know if any of the other colleagues who, who were here could maybe speak to that, but I'd like to maybe table that one in sure. terms of, of my understanding of that. Um, in terms of recruitment, right now at the elementary level, we don't have our, we have a phenomenal personnel leadership development team who get us all the fine teachers that we need, and we don't have a problem at elementary level having B-clad teachers that are world class to to teach. 
Where we sometimes hit a little bit of a pinch point is at secondary uh, because it requires not only having the B-clad that you spoke of, which um, for the public's benefit and um, those folks in the audience, uh, B-clad is the state certification that's needed in order to teach in Spanish. Um, not that you can just teach English learners, but that you can actually teach the content in another language. We sometimes have a challenge getting B-clad certified science credentialed teachers in secondary that have those two things. We have been able to do that at the middle school level. Um, we've been able to do that at um, one of the high schools because it becomes increased, kind of like a funnel. It becomes increasingly more specialized to try and find a teacher who has a B-clad and can teach biology both at the same time because it's such a specialization. So that does, in all honesty, that that is something that we have uh, struggled with, but I know that personnel has been all over this in helping us. Uh, we have active agreements with UC Riverside and with CBU to try and uh, you know get them to help us with their teacher preparation programs for that. So we are trying to uh, mitigate those challenges as best we can. Okay. Um, great. A um, couple taking AP Spanish in eighth grade. But then I also have been thinking, like, that's a lot of pressure to put on eighth grader to take an AP course. And what is the benefit of an eighth grader to take an AP course when if it's truly a college level course? So is there a reason why we're offering that so early on in the DLI experience? And what is our success rate on students passing the AP test? No, that's a good question. Uh, that was part of the original program design. Again, not being here for that design um, in that, but I can tell you that our success rate is well over 75% of the students and in some years approaching 80 to 90% of the students are getting a three or better. Okay. So they are well prepared to take that exam. I think it could be, at least how I've kind of conceptualized it, it could be considered that these are some of the most prepared students, even though they're only eighth graders. They've been taking Spanish and studying academic Spanish for eight years prior to the time they take that exam. A typical high schooler who comes in, as Superintendent Hill was mentioning, it comes in at ninth grade and takes it, you know, takes Spanish for the first time, Spanish one, Spanish two, Spanish three, and then goes to that um, as a junior or maybe senior. They might have only been studying it for three or four years. Um, and even though they've been studying it hard, they might not have that academic background to be able to do well. So we have students who are very well prepared and we see the same success rate when they take the AP Lang, which is a very uh, challenging literary analysis exam. They not only have to have the mechanics of Spanish language, but they have to be able to interpret and analyze text there, which is a quite a few rigor levels above um, what I think some people might understand and our students are successful. So I think that's a testament to the preparation that their teachers have provided in the years leading up to those students taking that exam. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Um, and my last thought as, you're, as you guys are looking into the uh, expansion at North and the impact that it might have, um, I don't know what the feasibility would be, but looking at uh, RVS, as an option to teach some of these Spanish language courses, whether it's history or math or science or whatever it is, so that it doesn't really matter where your school of attendance is, if the course that you're looking to take isn't being offered that semester or isn't offered at your school and you still wanna be like, let's say you're a, you, you've gone through, you've gone through the, um, the North uh, uh, feeder program and North ends up not getting a DLI program in high school, but you, you're a DLI student and you want to go to North and you want to continue taking classes in Spanish, that could be an alternative. I will definitely consider that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Uh, you know, I, Dr. Sosa, thank you for a great presentation. My colleagues covered so much ground. <laughs> I, I, there's one area that I wanted to expand upon more is the cultural uh, 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 the biliterate aspect, it's really more about the, the cultural dimension of this. You know, that's an important part of the DLI program, right? Uh, I just wanted to see how much you can elaborate on that component specifically and how it differentiates itself from the broader cultural education of the district or conversely, how much 
the specialty and what the DLI program is doing on the cultural piece, how much that can be drawn to doing in, in, in integrating in, in the broader district-wide educational curriculum for non-DLI students. You know, thank you for that question. I think it's a really good one. Uh, one of the things that I believe is a highlight of any language instruction is not only when you're taking a, a, a secondary language, I don't want to call it a foreign language because it's not foreign, a secondary language other than what you are born with, there's almost always an infusion of the cultural piece in there. So it's not just that mechanical understanding of the grammar and the nouns and how to put things together and then speak colloquially, but it's to be able to understand the cultural background of that. Um, we see that in DLI beginning at the, at the very beginning in kindergarten. Um, in fact, the last time I was in a DLI classroom, which was not too long ago, uh, not only is everything in, this was a fifth grade class I was in, so it's a 50-50 language split. Not only was everything in Spanish and in English, but there's also a ton of things in the classroom relating to culture and not just um, North American, uh, Hispanic or um, Spanish culture, but going all through the Americas and going into Europe, just a vast variety of artifacts and things to read and things that it would, there was evidence the kids were talking about it and learning about it and exploring it. They were just diving in to that immersive process. So in terms of uh, solid research-based instructional strategies about what works for students, we can definitely pull that out and then have that be across the district in many things that we do. And have we established any kind of uh, cultural opportunities with the Cheech, the Chicano art being, you know, headquartered here in, in our own city? Is, that, is, is there any special arrangement we have with, the, with them for the students to get those, that exposure? Uh, yes, our VAPA specialist has been working with the staff of the Cheech since its beginning to be able to uh, find an appropriate time for students to be able to explore that space. That's great, thank you. Trustee Kinnear. Thanks, good questions from, uh, from my colleagues. Uh, the matriculation issue is, is a, a real issue at, at North. We, we talked about that uh, in preparation for this meeting. But it's not just an, an issue for North. It's an issue in, in many other areas. Uh, I mean, one of the issues with, with North and matriculation is that Longfellow and Fremont have the smallest numbers of, uh, of DLI students in their grade levels. So the smallest numbers uh, of DLI students at the elementary schools are coming to one uh, middle school feeder program and then eventually to one high school. And if that doesn't right. change, then uh, then matriculation issues will will even be will even be greater. Uh, when I looked at the numbers, the matriculation issues are also true uh, at the from kindergarten through third, and then. Uh, because the numbers in kindergarten through third are, are huge compared to numbers in four through six. Uh, so uh, matriculation issues there uh, are, uh, are of, of issue. So I hope right. that we're talking about those uh, as, as we proceed through the future, not just as it relates to, uh, to, to North, uh, but uh, with, the, with the program uh, as, a, as a whole. You know, there's, there's a fiscal, we talked about this, there's a fiscal impact with uh, uh, with with DLI and that's really not clear to me uh, and I don't expect an answer tonight uh, but in in the future uh, particularly when we're making decisions in the future about DLI about expansion etc cetera, etc cetera, I'd like to know some of the fiscal implications if I look at um, if I look at our LCAP uh, DLI cost you know 12 to 14 million dollars uh, you know I, I don't think that's Accurate. I mean, I, I think there uh, it's complicated and I, I think there are other issues there, but uh, it's not going to be an easy thing to look at the cost of, L of, uh, of DLI. But I think uh, as we proceed into the future, uh, we, we should do that. Thanks for the info on, on, on achievement data. Uh, we, should, we should look at, at, uh, at the AP language course uh, data. And we should also look at AP at the at the AP uh, Spanish literature, literature data. As you as you said, mm -hmm. that Spanish literature classes. I mean, 
in English literature, AP, I don't think we have anybody who's not a senior that doesn't take that course. And we're doing it for our Spanish DLI kids in the 10th grade. In the 10th grade. Oh, so, you know, how are our kids doing in the, uh, in the AP Spanish Lit? And not only the percentage of, of kids who pass the exam, um, because, and, and that does tell a story, um, but the number of our kids that take the test also tell the story. We could have two kids take the test and they all pass. That doesn't uh, tell us any. I don't think that's happening. Uh, but, uh, but we need to look at the whole, the whole picture. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, I'm glad to see that, that we're offering the zero period at middle schools for, uh, for PE so that they can fit in a, a DLI elective. I know that's a, an actual cost for, uh, for us for the, for the DLI program, uh, but it would be unfair at the middle school if, we're, uh, if we want our kids to participate in the middle school program if we're not at least offering a zero period so that they can, they can pick up that band elective or, or whatever it is that, the, that, the, that they want. Uh, my, uh, my last one is, is really, I think I have the answer, but I don't know if we all have the answer. Uh, you know, D DLI kids have a lot to be proud of. If I was a, a DLI kid, I'd want everybody to know uh, w uh, what I've accomplished in my 12 years at, 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 at high school. Uh, are are uh, we putting this on, on our, our students' transcripts? Do they, do they know I'm taking uh, uh, world history in uh, the 10th grade in a, uh, a language that's, uh, that's, that's other than, than, uh, than English, you know, I want everybody to know those things. Uh, so, how, and so how do colleges, universities, how do future employers, uh, how do they know about my involvement with, uh, with, with DLI? Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Kinnear. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, we do acknowledge it on the transcript in uh, multiple of ways. We start by at the very top, and I don't mean to get technical. I'm going to get a little bit of technical here uh, just to answer your question because the technicality matters, I think, in this piece. We put on the top of the transcript that the student has participated in the DLI program. I don't have the exact wording, but it says something of that nature. We've been working behind the scenes for about the last 18 months with UC Doorways, which is the state organization that all of our courses go through so that they can be vetted for what we call A through G. So students can get, in, can get into Cal States and UCs. To be able to change the description of the DLI courses, so that they appear on the transcript saying having the language designation of DI or that's the common definition of that. So we were able to get that through doorways this last uh, year. And so the, uh, now moving forward, all of our students who are in there and they take a DLI uh, course at um, high school will have that designation built directly into their transcript, which will then help uh, during that evaluation process as they're going through college applications or if they're going to community college or if they go to an employer that it will note all of those things along there. That, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, that's a great benefit for uh, our students. That's, that's well deserved. I assume uh, oh, is that, is that going to happen retrospectively? So our kids who are, let's say, seniors at Poly this year, uh, it's go, is their ninth, are their ninth and 10th grade classes going to show that designation? Or? For students who have not graduated yet, yes, we'll Perfect. be able to, to apply that to all of their courses. Great. And one, one last question. Just, I just thought of it. Uh, I don't know what we do with the transcripts with advanced placement language at the eighth grade level, since that's an eighth grade class, not uh, on a high school trans transcript, how would we designate the AP uh, success of, of kids, either with the course or with the test? So in terms of the student having taken the course in middle school, the, um, the state, or I should say Cal State and UC, and the reason I reference that is those are the largest uh, systems in the state, and so we tend to follow what, what their guidelines are in terms of what needs to be on a transcript and what, because it gives our students the broadest opportunity for success after they leave us here. Um, the 
uh, CSU and UC do allow for high school courses to be taken in middle school, and so there is a section on their tra on a student's transcript that indicates that. That is even the same for students who aren't in DLI, but they take Spanish two at middle school because that does validate into high school uh, language credit for A through G um, by some guidelines. And again, I don't mean to get too technical on that, but there is that that place. In terms of a student uh, being able to tell a future college their score, they can request that score be sent from College Board to the whatever college that they would like. Is it on their transcript anymore? No, it's not on their transcript. It's not on the transcript at all. No, it's not on the transcript. And I can't elect for it to be on my transcript. That is correct. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Nice presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Trustee Hunt. Thank you. Nice. It is a nice presentation. I just have a couple of questions. One, going to uh, Mr. Lee's. I know that Mr. Lee and his good wife are very involved with their children's education, not just because he's a school board member, but because he is. But how do we engage, when I look at that attrition, how are we engaging or do we engage the parent guardians and helping them understand how important this is and helping them understand, you know, just the rigor and listening to them? Do we have a way to do that? Yeah, I think the best way that that's done really is through the teacher and the site principal, right? That connection with the family is, I think, best and strongest on the on the school site level. So as, uh, and, and the DLI community, as I think Mr. Lee can attest to, is very small and and not small in number, but it's tight, right? It's a it's a it's a big family, and so that connection to their teachers and their school administration, I think, is the is the strongest way that we provide information, provide consultation, provide uh, counseling, and talking to that way. Uh, if a family was considering making a different choice for DLI. Uh, that conversation would be had at the school site by uh, the principal, then sitting down with parents and whatnot, like they would do with any other parent. Thank you. My, my second question, and you know, Dr. Socia, I'm not an educator. I'm just someone significantly interested in it. But uh, I think it's a very good observation that in the sciences in particular, it's, you know, it's tough to even find really qualified uh, folks. Uh, to go into those areas and who aren't bilingual. But when you talked about mitigated, and again, if I make an ignorant statement, you'll, you'll forgive me and all, but could we consider, we, had a, we have an existing biology teacher that only speaks English. If we gave them, Ms. Power will have to correct me, but if we, if we paid for an intense program and I don't you know I don't want to say Rosetta Stone but I'm sure there's better ones in your academic world and then gave them a, a bonus a financial incentive to finish it in a year could that be considered can we create our own bilingual uh, staff I Thank think you. I will leave the financial incentive question to Assistant Superintendent Well, I'll, I'll worry about that on later. That. She'll find the money. It, we're not talking about a, a lot of... But, your, but to answer your broader question yeah. is, yes, in fact, we've done that. Oh, we have. We've identified teachers in the past who have an interest in obtaining their B-clad, and then we help support them to be able to take um, the courses if they need to, to be able to prepare for that. Uh, you might recall in years past when educators were needing to get um, their uh, English learner certification, many districts did the same thing 15 years ago in that realm. And so we have done in the past just what you are um, suggesting is when we have a teacher, uh, Miss Hill, who is a phenomenal biology teacher, and I know she has an interest um, in Spanish and might want to do that, we could help support her in that. Well, I'm asking to kind of go on the other side of the line. With teacher shortage across America, uh, you know, not so bad in, here in Riverside, but uh, I don't want to wait. I'm suggesting we don't wait for a teacher to say, hey, I'd be interested and get my B class. I want to set up a program that makes them say, I'm interested in getting in that program, and you're going to pay for everything, and I get a financial 
incentive at the end of it. It certainly would be, I would say, and I'm not speaking for my colleagues, but I certainly believe it would be a worthwhile investment that would pay off for years. So I just would like Superintendent Hill for you uh, and Dr. Sosa to, <laughs> and Ms. Power, our, our chief financial officer, who's got to find the money uh, to consider this. We will Thank definitely you. consider it. Thank you. That's a great suggestion, Trustee Hunt. Uh, student, uh, Trustee Lee. You were going to call me the student board member, weren't you? Oh, I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, so three, three of the things I was thinking about. Um, one, I know we had some issues a couple of years ago, maybe it was a result of COVID where we changed our model, um, where instead of having t uh, two teachers, an English teacher and a Spanish teacher, and then the, them switching, um, and then during COVID because of online and not spreading germs and whatnot, they kind of switched it, right? So they only had one teacher and the teacher kind of had to pivot back and forth between English and Spanish. And then the intent was once we went back to go back to that original model. And I think last year, some schools, well, one school in particular did not go back to that model. Other schools did. I know my, 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 at, at my kids' school, some grades did, some grades didn't. So I know there was some discussion about what to do with that. So where did we land next year? this year so we have clarified that we currently run a two-teacher model where we're able to do that and the reason i have that little qualifier is because as mr kinnear noted we have some of our schools that have a very small enrollment to begin with and they don't have the student numbers not just dli but they don't have the regular student numbers to have any more than two teachers that are there by the grade level um, Fre Fremont in particular because it is uh, tends to be a little bit of a smaller school so at so, what, so tell me what happens at Fremont give me an example so the grade levels in which they they don't have um, enough students to have two staff that are involved in DLI they have the one and so they, so have, they like have 30 that students model. or less in one grade level correct got it all right um, so I'll go back to my recruiting thing I understand. Two, um, oh, I was going to let Mr. Kinnear know. I'm glad that, that he thinks that zero period middle school is great. He can wake up my kids at oh, dark 30. If they want. Oh, them. my goodness. Every day it's a battle. Um, and then uh, combo classes. So I know that this has been an ongoing challenge at uh, our DLI schools. I think just because one, we have these specialty programs at traditional campuses, and that's caused friction over the years just between the traditional cohorts and the non-traditional cohorts, <clears throat> specifically because the way the DLI program has designed, you, you, you can't probably have a combo, and two, even you're just going to have smaller class sizes. So uh, teachers at some schools have, have you know, felt that it's unfair. Right. So what have we done to address that uh, this year? I know that we've limited the combos significantly, um, but in particular at our schools that are DLI, um, have we tried to make, uh, make it right for those that are disproportionately affected, if I'm saying that correctly? I think I would answer that to emphasize that the district has made a uh, yeoman's effort to reduce combination classes throughout the organization. As I think we just heard, we've reduced from what was in the 50s to 18 combo classes throughout the district. You are correct in that the design of the program at the smaller schools sometimes makes it uh, disproportionate at some of the upper grade levels because the number of students in the, in the class changes. The school site administration does everything they possibly can to uh, mitigate and take away those combos where they can. I, I think that is the best thing that I can say. And, and we absolutely recognize that some teachers who teach English only at DLI schools um, have told us that that is a burden and we absolutely understand that. Okay. Um, I think the, the last thing I'll say on that is 
I think the same care that we give to the DLA program, we should give to other similar programs that are non-traditional, giving the same care to those students and trying to break up combos that we do to our DLA. And I'm sure staff does take that in consideration when we're breaking the combos by giving extra consideration to those classrooms as well. Gotcha. Thank you, Trustee Lee. Student Board Member Rodero. Um, going back to Kinnear's question about um, students in the DLI program <coughs> being able to report that they took eighth grade uh, AP Spanish link on their UC or Cal State application. I know that on the application there is an option to put if you took a high school level or AP course uh, level in seventh, eighth grade to put it in there. My confusion is that is the reason why they can't do that is because they're offered the AP exam, but they're not given a specific class, like it's exam only for the DLI students or? Let me see. I'll try and answer your question. I think I understand. Is the question why we don't put the AP score on the transcript? Uh, the question is why can't they report it in their like, not the score, but the, their grade that they got in the class as an eighth grader, because it, it, it is a class, right? Yes. Okay, and they're, are they able to report their grade, what grade they got in that class on their transcript when they apply to like colleges? Yes, the grade, the actual letter grade is on the transcript, yes. Okay. Yes, so if I take AP Spanish um, Lang at Gage, let's say, um, it would say Gage Middle School, uh, AP Spanish Lang, um, well, for me, it'd probably be a C, but for you, it'd be an A, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. And, um, and then in terms of AP scores, um, regarding like Kinnear's um, question, it, they can put the year that they took the exam because it makes you put the year in. So if they see that this person was born in, I don't know, 2006 and they took the exam uh, 2018, they can see that, oh, this person took it at a very young age. Um, but my um, other question is the future programs, the International Bac uh, Baccalaureate uh, Program. Is it DLI students participating in the International Baccalaureate Program or are they like two separate? We're trying to figure out how they coexist with each other. That is correct. That's one of the considerations is to, is to figure out how they would coexist on the North Campus. Because my confusion is that we're struggling to find uh, student uh, teachers that are B-clad uh, that teach in science, so trying to find teachers that not only teach science in our B class, um, but also being able to teach IB level science would be difficult. So that was my confusion: is that like realistic uh, in the that future? Is, that is definitely something we need to consider for sure. Okay, all right. But in the future, we'd be able to have um, maybe like IB uh, courses taught in Spanish in the future, like in the very distant? I do believe it is a possibility. Okay. I, I have learned that um, the IB courses can actually be taught in a variety of languages. In fact, uh, I just learned from, from the school very recently that uh, International Baccalaureate gives subject-based exams in four world languages, and so it is possible. But specifically in California, like I know like IB isn't just uh, something in the United States is, international but Absolutely. specifically in like California is is that is do we see other school districts within California having multiple language uh, IB courses? I would have to research that I okay. don't have that at the top of my head okay all right thank you good question so thank you okay thank you uh, student board member there for those great inquiries uh, Dr. Sosa thank you for your presentation uh, we'll be moving on to the next agenda Adam thank you so much thank you our, uh, we're going to uh, move now to a report on the expanded learning opportunities in our school district, and this is uh, Kirsten uh, Frosto will lead us in this presentation. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Board President Dr. Farouk, Superintendent Hill, and esteemed members of our board. It is a pleasure this evening to be before you to provide an overview of RUSD's expanded learning program and review how it supports our district priorities, as well as share proposed adjustments to the expanded learning opportunities program. 
This evening's presentation will include an overview of the program and also what the state requirements are, our 2023-24 20, funding, an overview of our exploration days that we'll be providing this year, as well as a review of our metrics, and then some proposed examples of proposed plan adjustments. So on this slide, we see the overview of expanded learning program and all of the required components there in the blue. In the next column lists all the state requ minimum requirements for those components. And then in the far column there, we see what our USD's programs offer. We're pleased that we are meeting all of those minimum requirements, and not only that, but in many areas, we're exceeding those minimum program requirements. Some examples, the grade span, as well as the non-instructional days components. So the requirement from the state when they allocated this funding was to provide programs to transitional kindergarten through sixth grade, all of our elementary school. We are actually providing to our elementary and our middle school. So we've included seventh and eighth grade as well. For the non-instructional days, very similar. The requirement was for 30 days for elementary. And we have gone above those days with 31 for elementary, but also expanded to middle school 19 days in the summer for seventh and eighth grade. And then we also have a couple of other areas of increased academic support in the amount of time and also the number of hours because we have some earlier schools that dismiss early. And so we have increased hours that we provide. A little bit of Expanded Learning Opportunity Program 101 to give a little bit more detail here. All we're um, providing in alignment with our district priorities and making sure that we're providing a safe place for our students after school and during many, non, many of our non-instructional vacation days throughout the year so that they have supervision after school during that time and a safe place to be. In addition, we have our USD teachers and instructional assistants as well as our primary partners with the Boys and Girls Club staff and collaboration from our community partners where we're providing high quality experiential learning to our students. That includes CTE, visual and performing arts, and also STEM, as, long, as well as some other areas. We know that this helps to increase background knowledge for our students, which is one of the research-based strategies that helps increase student learning and well-being for our students. We also have amazing staff in all of our district departments and divisions. And without them and their collaborative support, we would not have been able to implement this wide expansion of our program. And you see there all of our divisions um, represented and how important that is and critical. So we appreciate their partnership in that. For 22, 2023, 2024, I'm having a hard time moving into this year, we are allocated a total of $29.3 million for this program. This has two parts to it. One is 5.3 million for our after school education and safety, which we refer to as ACEs. This is a state grant that we apply for. And then we have the expanded learning opportunity program, which is most of the funding of $24 million. Our exploration days for this year for TK through sixth, the purpose of these days is to really provide that supervision of students as well as the expanded learning opportunities. So the 30 required days, and we're providing 31 for elementary represented here, we have three days during the Thanksgiving break, which is a new time that we're providing this year. Winter break, four days then five days during spring break, which is also an addition, and then summer break. Summer break includes the 19 days for middle school as well. We'll be finalizing those dates as we work with other departments in our summer programs for this year. And once those are there, then we'll publicize that to our community as well. We do have our after school program metrics, first being our daily average attendance. For 21, 
22, we had 2,000 students and increased last year, 22, 23, to 4,000 students. It's a 100% increase in just one year. It's important to note we don't see 2021 data there because we were virtual that year. So we did not have that daily average attendance being kept as we had different delivery model for that. We also provide an annual uh, continuous quality improvement process survey to all of our families as part of ACES and expanded that to the expanded learning opportunity program plan as well. Overall program satisfaction maintained at 98%, which is marked since we also expanded and doubled the number of students that we were serving. We also saw maintaining in um, Guardian's ability to work, the program being able to allow parents and guardians to work. Where we did see a little bit of dip was in um, the perspective that child's, my child was safer due to the program and homework completion. When our team looked at that data further, where we saw an increase in um, selection was in the um, no opinion. And part of that, especially in the homework completion, is that for the new expanded learning program, a barrier was removed, which is previously students had to stay for the entire program. So they had to stay until six o'clock every day. That was removed, that requirement, which has also contributed to a a large increase in participation, but we have families now that don't necessarily um, have students staying for the homework help and completion. So that is where we see some of that variance. We began to, to uh, collect Exploration Day metrics last year. These are more of process metrics as an input and feedback. As it was a baseline year, first time we were offering it, we really wanted to know from families, were we meeting the need based on the vision that we had planned for. Daily average attendance was about a 750 students in the fall and increased by 100 students in the spring. And we gave a family survey as well. Um, we really were, uh, saw lots of positive overwhelming results with 95% of families likely to continue to participate again. Uh, the drop off and pick up procedures were helpful. And then over 90% indicating high ratings for our activities. Some feedback we received, so we'll be making some adjustments to our program. Students were um, asked to select a focus area in the CTE offerings that we were providing based on their grade span. This year, we'll be making adjustments to broaden so that students have more choices and can participate in all of them if they would like, so that we're broadening those experiences and enrichment. Some next steps. We are going to be soliciting more educational partner input and feedback in the form of listening sessions planned for later this month and into November. Our plan is to incorporate that feedback with the feedback that we received from parent survey results to begin to make adjustments to our plan. On this slide are some of those categories of proposed adjustments. Our program has really grown quickly and we've learned a lot in just a short year. Meeting the needs of our students' safety as well as engaging environments and that high quality learning remains our top priority. What we did in our first version of our plan was provided some generality so that we could make those adjustments as we brought that vision to reality. And what we'd like to do in this next iteration of the plan is bring some of those adjustments formally into our plan with more specificity to ensure that we're remaining in alignment with the program compliance as monitoring is beginning with this program. We also want to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our families. Some of the examples under, one example under safe and supportive environment section is making sure to add some specificity to staff needs, equipment, and structures to ensure safety, accessibility, and increased usage or participation in the programs. Under curriculum, looking at, again, specificity and components and acknowledgements in what curriculum that we're doing and providing choices to best fit each school community. 
An example under Healthy Choices and Behavior section is bringing the two programs in alignment, our ACEs program as well as expanded learning, so that we don't have to look at two different requirements in the program and that we're meeting the minimum of both in the area of physical daily activity, which is part of the ACEs program. Under the diversity, access, and equity section, a couple of examples, adding language to increase our inclusive practices and inclusion of all students, and language for options that we can meet the needs of our newcomer population as that is beginning to grow again. And then under program management, just making sure to update and include positions needed to support the expansion of the program and the facilities needs. We would be remiss in not really formally thanking all of our community partners, and in fact, there isn't even enough room on one slide to provide that acknowledgement for all of them, but these are a number of our premier partners, both in district and out of district, and it's gaining every single day, actually. And also a formal thank you to our expanded learning program coordinator, Mrs. Jerry Castro, who's with us also this evening, and her amazing staff for their leadership in bringing this vision into reality in such a short time as she participates in learning communities with her colleagues across the county and across the state. We are reminded about how much farther ahead than other districts we are in this area of providing great high quality programs for our students. And with that, that concludes the formal presentation and I'll step aside for any public comments. Thank you so much, Ms. Foster, for that great presentation, and thank you, Ms. Castro, for all your leadership. This the program has such a, an important impact, not on just on the lives of the students, but on neighborhoods and the community overall, so th thank you for, for that. Uh, Dr. Hernandez-Alexander, do we have any public input on this item? No, we do not. Okay, uh, we'll start with you on board member comments. Oh, thank you so much. This this was this was an excellent presentation. I have a, a question um, on slides seven and eight. Um, with summer break, the nineteen days that um, that are here in the gray, are these to be in addition to what would be summer school? Or I know we're not calling it summer school, but or is this um, in lieu of, or is this a different program? Also. So it's a combination of both. Some of them, these would be planned non-instructional days. For instance, the 19 days for our middle school, these are in a, they are counting the summer program that we provide to our middle school. For our elementary, we have these 19 days and then we have, a, we have exploration days and our summer program. So we're providing both. Okay, okay. And, that, and, and this might be out of the scope of this conversation, but is there conversation about still pr providing two sessions in summer? Yeah, two two-week sessions. Two two-week sessions yes. in summer. Has there been any conversation about breaking up those sessions into the beginning of summer and the end of summer? Or is this conversation still back-to-back? So we right now are engaging in those conversations through summer program planning. So we have okay. not finalized what that model is going to look like. We're still having those discussions. Okay. Thank you. And then my last question is with the homework completion. So um, my kids participated in this, uh, in, in, the, in this program when it first came out and we were really excited about the whole idea of, of homework completion. Um, and first of all, thank you for removing the barriers of time because that was a huge barrier. It's like, like well, I, I want to pick them up at 4.15 because that's when I got out of work or whatever, and I couldn't pick them up at 4.15. It had to be like 6 or 4 or whatever. So thank you for doing that. I think that you're right. That did kind of ease the, the barriers, and now people want to be participating in it. As a parent, um, homework completion is the number one reason to put a student um, in an after-school program obviously safety and all of that is as well, but um, is there any um, expectation of whatever program is running, whether it be HARDS or whoever's running the program in the evening after, after school, is there an expectation as to when homework and tutoring happens within their programming? There's an expectation of the amount of time 
Um, one thing we try to be cognizant of is providing students some break between the yeah. long day of the academic focus in school, providing them snack, providing them some time to go out and do some of that physical activity and just some brain breaks in there and then bring that homework back in. Yeah, that makes, yeah, that, that makes total sense. So would you say homework is kind of on, on it? it because my son would complain that he didn't get around to doing his homework, but I'm always wondering like how much of that is actually true. <laughs> so is it? Is I experienced it, the same <laughs> comments, by the way, with my son when he was in the program as it's well. Like, wh why? Why aren't you? Why didn't you do your homework? It's like we never got around to it. It's like, well, okay. So I am curious, and I think most parents are. Is like, what is the expectation of? I would hope that the expectation that step one is get a break, get outside, get a snack, and then is it? okay homework and then whatever activity whether it be art or whatever that follows is that i'll go ahead and um, ask miss castro to come up she has a little bit more specificity on the schedule recommended schedules okay. for each of our programs I th i'm just i'm asking because i think a lot of us wonder um, kind of how that works so we do encourage that homework be done earlier but it does have to also do with facility usage Okay. So some of our programs grew from 83 students to 190 to 200 students. And so we want to make sure that um, they're getting that attention that they, they need for that support for homework. And the ratios of staff to students had changed as well. So for our littles. So we wanted to make sure that there is that break. We are cognizant of the lunch and also the area of which space we take up for eating and then getting into the classrooms. So we want to make sure that we're providing a little bit of a break for the, the staff that's in there as well as they close out their day um, and going in and making sure that the homework is done. And we do take the parent feedback and hence the listening sessions that are coming up as well. And we are supporting our staff with making sure that their schedules meet that. So there's a minimum requirement of an hour of academics under ACEs. And you can imagine, we hope, because I know board policy is 10 minutes per grade level, but TK and K wouldn't need the whole hour. So we do other things within that. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Does that conclude your question? Thank you, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll, we'll turn it over to Trustee Lee. So yeah, just quickly, um, kudos, kudos. Thanks to you and your whole team. I mean, to, to double the capacity of a program over the course of a school year and not suffer any quality loss by measuring with, with parent engagement, I mean, it's pretty, pretty phenomenal. And hats off to, to you and everybody else. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, no, no specific questions for me uh, in regards to the program. I'm glad that we do it. I'm glad that there's a budget for it. I hope that that budget remains robust so that we can continue to offer that to our students because I do think it is great for parents so that they don't need to rush to get their students. Um, it's a safe place for kids to, to hang out after school, uh, to make sure they have proper nutrition, to hopefully get their homework done, but then also be able to play and do things kids are supposed to, supposed to do in a safe place, right? Where they might not get to do that if both parents are working. Uh, so I think it's awesome. My one question is listening sessions. So I just wanted some clarification. I think I got it from Ms. Castro, but so the listening sessions are designed for parents to, for us to listen to parents. All right, so I, as my, maybe it's just me, but listening sessions could be you listen to us or it could be we listen to you. Um, and I know, I think we called listening sessions in the past for LCAP and participation what wasn't what we had anticipated. So I'm not saying the word listening is discouraging people from participating, um, but as we look to try to engage parents so they participate in that, we might want to think about how we, how we term, term their participation so it's inviting and more uh, participatory than you know, the, the inactive uh, action of listening, right? Thank you very Seems much like for that right. feedback. Yes, the goal is for us to do, provide the overview, do very little talking and a lot of listening right. about what else we can do to remove right. those barriers. I know it's hard, it's program. a challenge to get people to participate because they have busy lives and other things, but 
uh, just just my my two cents. But yeah, appreciate well done that. to you both, and thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lee, Superintendent Hill. Can I didn't know if yours was timely. I'll go last. No, okay, I'll go last. Uh, student board member Odero. Uh, I just want to thank you again for um, expanding the program because I know like not just like RUZ but other districts parents complain about not being able to pick up their child a little earlier when they like get off work early um, so um, props again to the team um, and then what my question is that I see that with the overview expanding on slide four that we're able to expand from TK to sixth grade to TK, TK to eighth grade and um, also go above and beyond with the uh, requirements on that page. Is that with state funding only, or is that state funding and district funding? That is all from state funding. Okay. The ACEs and the expanded learning program expansion. Okay. And then um, in addition to that, uh, I know it says like enrichment or VAPA. What constitutes as VAPA? Is VAPA arts and craft or is it like after school band practice? I would say both in terms of there are some arts and crafts but we also partner with like Riverside Arts Museum and bringing in um, performing arts as well as visual arts and we also have Riverside Arts Academy that we partner with as well. Okay and then going back to the funding if it's primarily state how is it that um, we're able to expand from TK to 6 to TK to 8th without suffering like quality loss? So the state expanded the funding at quite a bit. I almost want to say exponentially because that is what it feels like. <laughs> quite a bit. And I really want to give kudos to the team in being very intentional in the work and working with sites to ensure that that expansion was done in a way that we could keep up with that um, and making sure to work as a team. And they are in constant contact with school sites and administrators and they're what we call teacher on special assignments that are coordinating this work at the site to make sure that as they're providing that coaching and support and really they do a lot of driving around in the afternoons because it's not just um, calling on the phone, but being right there, walking them through things side by side. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Kinnear. You were finding out about his homework and how much time they're spending. But, yeah. uh, a couple of questions. Uh, do we offer services to unduplicated students that we don't offer to uh, to other students and if the answer is yes uh, how are unduplicated students handled in this program it's not necessarily that it's different we have priority in making sure that our students who are unduplicated are enrolled first in the program so if we do have space and capacity issues with staffing we're making sure to meet their needs first so the program the is the same but they have priority mm -hmm. in terms of their enrollment mm -hmm. do we offer transportation we do uh, so so students on the east side who are bused to, to taft and participate in the the taft program uh, are given uh, transportation home after after the program Good. yes and that's a significant uh, also barrier that's been removed as transportation was not always included in our previous grants Good. Uh, do we have do we have a, a way of uh, or have we discussed ways that we might measure uh, uh, the impact of this program on academic achievement Yes, thank you for bringing that up. That's part of our next steps as well. We've spent time really doing what we call process data to make sure that our implementation is in a good place. That's actually what we're exploring right now with some partners. Um, Ms. Castro and actually Dr. Sosa and I were talking about this earlier today. That is our next step and there are uh, programs out there now, as you can imagine, this is a big market for companies to help us to better identify and um, 
ensure that we're identifying the students that are participating and also their participation rate. Because now that the attendance, you don't need to be there the whole time or every day, we want to make sure that we're including in the impact students that are regularly participating and what that level is. Great. Thank so you we for will doing be bringing that. that. I look forward to, to hearing about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, to Superintendent Hill. Uh, thank you for the great report. Um, and it, it just a reminder from me to the board to that there's also externalities of the of the of the greatness of the program because the um, just the additional pressure on our facilities for one thing, scheduling of custodial staff, availability of uh, space to teachers. You know they typically typically have their their classrooms to themselves so to speak, and now we're sharing with after school. So um, Mrs. Castro does a awesome job of navigating all that but those are things that you don't see you know in the in a presentation about the the program implementation and outcomes thank you to superintendent hill uh Ms. foster i just have one one uh general comment i know there's a lot of discussion around the capacity and that you guys have ramped up you know the program the funding you know the complexity of the facility there's a lot of variables that being said the the intrinsic value of students having these opportunities is significant. Uh, what's your perspective in terms of like the potential need uh, from a district-wide perspective relative to the amount of the number of students that you're able to accommodate currently? I think right now our biggest challenge is staffing and making sure we're maintaining, which we're experiencing in more than just after-school programs. That's across the board that we've. Uh, been working through those challenges. I think what has really helped with that is our partnership, our close partnership with Boys and Girls Club and personnel in making sure that we are um, recruiting and that we are getting high quality. Um, one of the amazing things, if I could take a minute to share, when we had um, at Fremont what was that, like the first week of school when we had the emergency response and Principal um, Bradvika's just amazement in primarily their college students who are the Boys and Girls Club staff, you know, with their after school um, work study types of things. And they were phenomenal in their response and support and safety and knew exactly where all their students were and got them to safety quickly and followed all of those and stayed nice and calm. So I think um, it's just a matter of continuing those partnerships so that we get first dibs or crack at all of those great people out there. Do you think that the organizations that, the, the, I know there's a number of groups that we partner with, how the ones that were the the partnerships that are most impactful, I guess, or the scale of it, do they often work with a number of school districts, not just ours? They do. Um, I think what is helpful, though, is that we have there are so many now uh, companies and partnerships in this area available as communities and um, our really looking at scaling up and meeting this need. So there's a lot more availability now than there even was a year ago. I, I don't know if this would make things worse, but I'm just putting this out there. Uh, do you think there would be any value in, in the, the nature of this kind of program being done in a more regional manner uh, to consolidate the limited staffing and the, or, the same organizations that if they didn't have to coordinate with multiple school districts, maybe some of our surrounding ones, could that allow a greater overall capacity and efficiency, or it's, it, it, the inner district aspect would make it things difficult? So clarifying question, Dr. Fruh, when you say regional, are you meaning with um, other part, school districts, yes. regional? Yeah, um, just our surrounding, like it could be Alvord, it could be, you know, Harupa, maybe. I, I, I don't know how, to what radius it would, it, it would make sense. I'm just putting that out there if there's... So I think what makes our program really unique is the amount of participation by our own staff and certificated staff. So when we look at some neighboring school districts, they're taking a little bit different approach in relying on uh, outside agencies to run the program for them on their campuses. 
and we have found so much value in leveraging this to build school community and strengthen our school community and that connection to the program and really expand learning from the time students arrive to campus in the morning until they leave at whatever time through the after school program and then those exploration days. So that would be a little bit of a challenge in coming together on different philosophy and methodologies of that program. Well, certainly our approach, I think, has the most sustainable, you know, enduring uh, impact. Um, but we are making the judgment that beyond that, having uh, an external party, if, you know, beyond the, our capacity, if we was to be able to accommodate, it's if the, the value, the return of that still would be better off than not doing it because we haven't internally built that capacity. Is that... Uh, some areas that we may be able to look at some regional partnerships also are in exploration days as those are during those vacation times and we actually want to provide our staff also the break um, so that's a opportunity where mrs castro is reaching out to regional partners and community partners to really look at how we can work together on those days so that's probably a first place to look at for that Sure, and even like I said with the external contracting, I, mm -hmm. the spirit of obviously where I'm going with this is we just want to make sure that as many students that w w have the need and value for this that they get that opportunity. So I'll say thank you again for all of your guys' efforts. Thank you. Thank you. So that uh, concludes our uh, last report. Uh, the next two items on our agenda were requested by a community member per Education Code 35145.5 and Board Bylaw 9322. These items have been placed on the agenda and there is no staff report for either item. Since there is no presentation at this time, uh, I'm asking Dr. Hernandez-Alexander on any public input items related to these. Uh, this is regarding a request for review of school site safety plan approval procedures. Yes, Mr. President, we have three. Okay, so uh, Sandy R. Welcome, Ms. R. You have three minutes. Thank you. So I want to take you back to the first week of September as the reason why I added this topic to the agenda. Um, I wasn't able to make it to your last meeting because I had planned to do that then. Uh, I came across a ring alert on my phone about a little boy wandering alone on the street. Someone posted this in my group and this incident needs to be discussed. The boy was a six-year-old autistic nonverbal child, student. He attended Ben Franklin Elementary and somehow got off campus. He wandered the streets of Orange Crest for 45 minutes and he managed to get about a mile away from the school. This little boy was blessed and that a man saw him, called the police, and followed him to make sure that he was safe until they arrived. During this time, the school did not even realize that he was off campus. They never notified the family or any emergency contacts that they couldn't locate the boy. The family saw the ring notification, and that's how they learned that he was missing. This is every mother's worst nightmare. We drop off our kids at school and we think they're safe. This child could have been abducted, hit by a car, or murdered. Mothers panic when they lose their child for just a minute in a store, in a park, or anywhere for that matter. The thought of a child lost for 45 minutes would send a mother into full panic mode. Compound that with the fact that he has special needs, and I can't even begin to imagine that mother's fear. The way this school site handled the situation was completely inappropriate. The way you handled the situation, Superintendent Hill, was inappropriate. Let me quote from your post on social media. Two littles got away from their campuses but were returned quickly and unharmed. 45 minutes is not quickly. I don't know if you're a mother, but that statement leads me to believe you're not. I have no idea what happened to the other little that you're referring to in the post, but it does not sound good. That comment was just so glib and off the cuff and just, just discounting the panic that that family felt. There are so many questions that the parents now have about school safety. How did this little boy get out of the school? Why did no one see him and stop him? 
Were there emergency, why were the emergency contacts not notified? Why did no one search outside the school, drive around the area? What in-service has been conducted with staff? Has a safety walkthrough of the site been conducted? Uh, what weaknesses have been identified? Are there alarms at the doors or gates if, if opened? Um, how will this be prevented in the future? Has this cabinet reviewed the school site plans for this and other schools? I hope since this item was agendized that now you'll be able to address and discuss the situation and how it's going to be prevented because the parents deserve to know that when they drop their children off at your schools that they're going to be safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Har. Our staff will follow up on that item. Our next uh, uh, community agenda item is uh, the non the request for review of administrative regulation 5145.3 non non discrimination harassment. Dr. Hernandez Alexander has provided me two comment cards on this. Uh, we'll start with Leticia Pepper. Okay, then. Uh, Right. She emailed you about the court case. Welcome, Senator. Okay, so September 14th, I emailed this board and the superintendent the details of Mirabel and West versus Olson. This case specifically pertains to AR 5145.3 for Escondido Union. This policy mirrors AR 5145.3 that RUSD has. This was probably provided by the California School Board Association. The AR for this policy was never approved by the board at the same time that the policy for 5145.3 was approved. The AR adoption did not include an opportunity for parental or public input before its implementation. The judge in this case ordered the injunction and stated the following, the school's policy is a trifecta of harm. It harms the child who needs parental guidance and possibly mental health intervention to determine if the incongruence is organic or whether it is a result of bullying, peer pressure, or a fleeting impulse. It harms the parents by depriving them of the long recognized 14th Amendment right to the care, guide, and make health care decisions for their children. And finally, it harms the plaintiffs who are compelled to violate the parents' rights by forcing plaintiffs to conceal information that they feel is critical for the welfare of their students, violating the plaintiff's religious beliefs. This district has the same policy of harm. I put this item on the agenda in the hopes that you will do the right thing and not wait until one of your teachers sues. You have a fiduciary duty to the taxpayers who fund these schools. Lawsuits will come. Jessica Tapia in Harupa Valley is already suing her district regarding this same policy. Chino Valley, Temecula, and several other districts have already amended their policies to require parental notification. Parents have a right to know and be supportive of their kids the same way you would notify me if my kids were failing, doing drugs, or getting into fights so that we can resolve the issues together. The other side is that this policy makes teachers agree to lie as a condition of employment. I know I have established that some of your employees don't have an issue with lying to parents, but that doesn't mean that all of your staff is okay with it. Some of you claim to be Christians, so you should be familiar with the Ten Commandments and the fact that it states that thou shalt not bear false witness. You are making your Catholic, Christian, and other religious um, teachers go against their beliefs and lie to parents. You have the opportunity to join the other districts in revising this policy. Do the right thing, not just because the law compels you. AB 1266 does not require you to lie to parents. You are again confusing laws and recommendations. Um, parental notification is an 88% favorable um, for, for parents. 91% of parents believe that the government um, that the parents, not the government, have the greater responsibility to raise children. This is Rasmussen survey. Thank you, Ms. Hart. Our staff will follow up on that. Uh, we will now uh, come to our Trustee Kinnear. Thanks. I have a, a comment about uh, Mrs. R's last presentation. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. R, I sincerely appreciate your questions. Your questions challenge me to think, and you make me think, uh, and I, and that's important to me, and and, and I like that. However. When you personalize comments with our superintendent, I'm offended by that. 
that when, when you start asking questions about our superintendent and you don't know if she's a mother or she's not a mother, I do take offense to that and that bothers me. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Trustee Kinnear. Uh We now come to our meeting conclusion. Uh, so if any board members have any, uh, would like to request any agenda items for future meetings, please let me know. Okay. Uh, we will now adjourn at 9.05 p.m. in memory of Nellie Fleming, who was a curriculum administrator with the Riverside Unified School District during her career in education. God bless.